Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Board of Trustees of the West Ada School District. As is our custom, we'll begin by reciting the pledge. The flag is to the west of the dais. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we move on with the agenda, oh, clerk, I'm used to you being over here. Um, clerk Newbold, do you have any uh, changes or amendments? Chairman, trustees, Superintendent Reynolds, I've attached all the documentation to the agenda online. Um, any additional information you received and patron comments up till 1230 this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk Newbold. Do any trustees have any changes or amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, then we'll move on to the consent agenda, and I would entertain a motion with regards to it. Trustee Johnson. Mr. Chair, I move that we adopt the consent agenda. Thank you, Trustee Johnson, for the motion to adopt the uh, consent agenda. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Trustee Kloffenstein, for the second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, then I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And it's unanimous. That brings us to the discussion portion of the agenda. And the First item is the Medical Professional Review of the West Ada Safety Plan, and this evening we have the pleasure of Dr. David Pate presenting that. Floor is yours, Dr. Pate. Uh, thank you, Chairman Newhoff, uh, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Reynolds. At the superintendent's request, I have now been working with the team for about a week and a half. We have engaged on an aggressive schedule of review of the operational and health and safety plans, identifying opportunities, engaging stakeholders, and planning for going forward. I would like to review three things with you this evening. First, my engagement work to date and things the superintendent, assistant superintendent, and I are looking uh, to as next steps. Second, an overview of the findings from my review so far. And third, how the team and I arrived at the pro proposed criteria that you will review this evening as to when schools should go remote. I would like to start off with some comments about the team. I want to applaud the superintendent's vulnerability in bringing me and four of my colleagues in as medical advisors. This requires great humility, and one might think that this is quite typical of leaders, but it is not. The entire team that I have been working with, the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, Tracy Garner and Char Jackson, have been incredibly welcoming of my efforts and receptive to my feedback and advice. They are incredibly dedicated to the children of the West Ada School District and passionate about our common goal. For those parents who wish to have their children in in-person classes, how can we accomplish that while keeping staff, teachers, and students and their families as safe as possible? Even in just the short time that I have been working with them, Despite the fact that I have delivered some messages that might not be easy to hear, they have not been defensive, and in fact, I have witnessed them putting many of these recommendations in practice already. So first of all, a review of the work to date and the things the superintendent, assistant superintendent, and I are looking at as next steps. As of now, I have reviewed the health and safety plan and issued a draft report. That report has been reviewed by, and I have included suggested modifications from the four additional physician advisors that the superintendent has engaged. Dr. James Souza, the chief medical officer at St. Luke's Health System, who has testified before this board previously. Dr. Stephen Nemerson, 
the Chief Clinical Officer for St. Alphonsus Health System, Dr. David Peterman, the President and CEO of Primary Health Medical Group, and Dr. Mark Nasser, the President of St. Alphonsus Medical Group, who has also served as an advisor to the Boise School District. I have also reviewed the operating plan and submitted a draft report that is currently undergoing review by my colleagues, and that report has been submitted to the leadership team, and I believe the superintendent has shared both reports with you. I should also mention that I have been in frequent contact with Gina Pinnell and Haley Cervenka at Central District Health to review both of these reports and to incorporate their guidance as it's important that we not get out of sync with the public health uh, department. At the superintendent's invitation last week, I participated in a webinar with teachers to answer the very excellent questions that they submitted. Also last week, the team and I engaged in the challenging process in an attempt to come up with a recommendation for the board as to when schools should go to remote given the change in the Central District Health and the State Board of Education's guidance. And of course, th that a recommendation has been submitted to you for your review tonight. Following the guidance from the board this evening, the team and I will discuss next steps, some of which are already in progress. First, a survey of every classroom in the district to determine where the challenges are with physical distancing. Second, an examination of the steps necessary to achieve the required distancing for those classrooms that are currently unable to do so. Third, steps to address the deficiencies my colleagues and I identified in the current plans. Fourth, education and training of staff and teachers to ensure that the corrections to the plans are implemented. Fifth, a rewrite of the operational plan to ensure that the plan is updated, clear, and concise. Sixth, I will be engaging my physician colleagues and Central District Health to look at the particularly challenging programs offered in schools for which our standard precautions may not be practical, most notably special education. Seventh, dissemination and education of all staff and teachers to the revised plan. Eight, walkthroughs of the schools. These are invaluable and allow us the opportunity to see what is working well and what additional concerns need to be addressed. Because I cannot physically conduct walkthroughs of all the schools in the West Ada School District, I will use the first several walkthroughs as opportunities to train others how to perform these. I will also prepare a tool for them to use to assist them in conducting the walkthroughs. Nine, after we identify issues from the walkthroughs, we will go back and update the operational plan to address these issues and then disseminate the revised operational plans along with education of staff and teachers to the changes. And finally, once all the changes have been made to the final operating plan, I will then work with someone from the IT department to create an audit tool. The audit process will involve personnel who are not based at the school being, that is being audited to do a walkthrough and to make assessments of the degree of compliance using that newly designed audit tool. The beauty of this is that then the superintendent and whoever she designates can pull up a dashboard that will be updated each week and will tell her the level of compliance with the plan that we have district-wide by school, by grade, by type of school, elementary, middle, or high school. It will also tell her what the top areas of non-compliance are and direct her and the local school leaders as to the additional steps needed to get to a higher level of compliance with the plan. This tool will also be helpful to determine whether there is a deterioration in compliance after school breaks or holidays. So the second uh, part is an overview of the key findings from my review of the operating and health and safety plans so far. 
while there is no doubt that the team has put much time and effort into these plans, as Dr. Souza testified to you this summer, with the disease transmission anticipated this fall, and it certainly appears that we're going to exceed even what was anticipated, the only way to give schools a fighting chance is, to remain open is for, for in-person learning is to have a very well-developed operating plan that is implemented very well. There are portions of the current plans that need to be updated, some parts that need to be corrected, and a number of places that just need to be clarified. Further, we need to make sure that the plan is clear enough and concise enough that all staff and teachers will read it, understand it, and be able to quickly access it as a resource for questions they may have. Furthermore, I will be working with the team to take the best parts of the current plan and to do a rewrite to achieve the goals I just mentioned. Second, while my report outlines a number of technical changes, the major things that we must focus on immediately are appropriate physical distancing and wearing proper face coverings properly. On the physical distancing front, the assistant superintendent has commissioned every school to do a survey of its classes to identify which classes cannot achieve physical distancing on a regular basis. We will then work with those local schools to problem solve this. One of the major things we need to work on relative to physical distancing is the use of pods. We need to understand and make sure that parents understand that we should al always strive for physically distancing each student in a classroom. In those cases where that is not possible, and working together with local leadership, we can't identify a solution to make it happen, then consideration can be given to creating pods. To be clear, pods cannot be the entire classroom and should be the minimum number of students, ideally just two, three, or four, necessary to, in order to ensure that the pods can be physically distanced. Pods can be appropriate in elementary schools, but they are unlikely to be for middle and high schools. Keep in mind that the creation of pods is an acknowledgement that we cannot keep students individually distanced in the classroom, and therefore, we are intentionally creating close contacts. However, we are doing so in order that uh, in the event of an infection, we only need to quarantine the pod rather than the entire classroom. With respect to wearing proper face coverings properly, the biggest issue I have identified is the inappropriate substitution of a face shield for a face covering. Frankly, this is due to misunderstandings that have been widespread throughout almost every school whose plans I have reviewed. There are three major mechanisms of transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And in descending order of what we currently believe to be the frequency, they are droplet, aerosol or airborne, and then contact. A face shield provides little, if any, protection to either the wearer or those in contact with the wearer for droplet and for aerosol or airborne transmission. Face shields were intended for use in medical settings in which healthcare workers need to conduct procedures on patients that are likely to induce gagging, coughing, and or vomiting. The face shield is intended to block a splash or other potentially large amount of liquid expelled uh, from contam uh, contaminating the healthcare worker's face and eyes. For this reason, healthcare workers always wear a mask in addition to a face shield, never as an alternative. While I have no objections to students or teachers wearing a face shield in addition to a face covering, we have discussed alternative solutions for those particular situations in which a teacher needs a student to be able to observe their lips moving. 
Third, I would like to conclude by explaining the reasoning behind the proposed criteria for moving schools to remote, the criteria which the superintendent and assistant superintendent are going to review with you shortly. To many of us, the change in Central District Health guidance of how schools could or should operate in red came as a bit of a surprise, especially for those of us that did not have access to the data concerning schools. Further, the change produced angst among many of the teachers when they expected one thing and quite another was recommended. Prior to school opening, many of us, and I believe reasonably so, expected that transmission of infections in schools would mirror the transmission in the communities. Therefore, it made sense to tie school operational colors or categories to indicators of community spread. Thus, Central District Health had identified a benchmark of 22 average daily new cases per 100,000 population as a criteria for their determination of when to move to red. And while the back to school framework was not entirely clear on this point, teachers made a reasonable inference that moving into the red or category three meant a move to remote learning. And in fact, a level of 22 new daily cases per, per 100,000 population is quite high and clearly represents uncontrolled community spread. But by the time Central District Health put us back into the red category, we already had experience with in-person classes. Here is what we observed, and by the way, this is not peculiar to Idaho. First, aside from some sports and other extracurricular activities, on contact tracing, Central District Health did not detect significant and consistent spread of infection within schools. In other words, most students who tested positive appeared to be infected through their own family or in high risk activities taking place outside of school. That is certainly not meant to suggest that there is no transmission in school, but the schools where this has been the biggest problem are those school districts who have no requirement for face coverings or merely encourage them. Second, thus far, clinical studies have suggested that young children, namely those less than 10 to 12, tend not to transmit the virus as efficiently as adults. But children older than that appear to be able to transmit the virus almost as efficiently as, as or as efficiently as adults. And in fact, that is how it is played out in West Ada School District schools thus far. We have had most of the transmission issues in high schools and few in elementary schools. Middle schools are, pardon the pun, in the middle. Thus, third, thus it appeared that by and large, community spread was contributing to infections in teachers, staff, and students, but outside of certain sports and extracurricular activities, there was little evidence that transmission was occurring within schools and then driving community spread up. So I visited with Central District Health to see if they had developed a new specific criterion or new community spread target that they would use to advise or order schools to move to remote. They had not. I met with the team and we discussed this at length. Everyone acknowledged the desire to be able to have a, an objective number, especially one that could be followed in order to let parents and teachers know ahead of time what direction we're headed in. I have recommended against this approach for the following reasons. First, while recognizing that transmission characteristics certainly can change with even higher levels of community spread and with the confounding addition of cold and flu viruses, 
creating co-infection with this virus, uh, actively already being transmitted in the Treasure Valley, it would be foolish for us to peg a move to remote on another, albeit higher, level of community spread when, as I mentioned, to our surprise, we are not seeing a direct correlation. Second, pegging a move to remote on a specific number risks com uh, committing the administration and this board to a district-wide move even if we are only seeing transmission concerns in certain schools or certain geographical areas or certain types of schools such as high schools. Again, reviewing our intended goal of keeping kids in person for school for those parents who wish that, so long as we can do so safely, led us to consider the agony of making a decision to move for example, all elementary schools to remote, especially given that these children seem to benefit the most from in-person learning if the only problems we are seeing is really only in high schools, for example, or middle and high schools. Third, we discuss the potential for only a single school to be significantly affected, as has occurred in other school districts. Continuing with the example of a potentially problematic spread in one or more high schools, we agreed that the goal should be to retain maximum flexibility in our criteria, such that if only one or two high schools were problematic, we not, need not move all high schools to remote learning. Fourth, we believe that this approach is in alignment with what all stakeholder groups want to be able to provide in-person learning to those who choose to have this option so long as we can reasonably assure the safety of staff, teachers, students, and their families. So in crafting our proposed framework for identifying when the need would be to move to remote learning, we started out with these guiding statements. Number one, until the pandemic is brought under control, and that is not likely to be this school year, we are going to have identified cases in our, in our schools. In fact, it may be that because of in-person learning, we actually identify cases that otherwise would not have been identified in the child's home. Second, these cases should be isolated and sporadic cases as opposed to clusters or outbreaks. Third, if we have a good and effective operations plan, it should result in us promptly identifying these cases, isolating them, contact tracing, and quarantining close contacts. Fourth, the evidence of a defect in our operational plan is if we are having clusters of cases or ultimately an outbreak. Clusters should alert us to a defect in our plan or compliance with our plan that we need to promptly remedy and explore whether other schools appear vulnerable to the same risks, in which case we can intervene to potentially avoid that development. Fifth, outbreaks would be a particular concern. They should be identified promptly, investi investigated together with Central District Health, and could very well precipitate the need to go remote. However, this would be targeted at the involved school while we looked at other similarly situated schools to determine if they are showing signs or face the same risks of developing an outbreak. While this approach doesn't provide the beauty of a single objective number that can be measured, reported, and followed, it avoids the situation in which using a single number causes us to either have to follow through with moving all schools to remote, even if we see little evidence of disease transmission in our schools or all the schools, or another deterioration of the trust that is so important 
with our teachers if we establish such a number and then change the guidelines again when that number is reached, but we are not seeing significant and consistent evidence of disease transmission within our schools. So I have four concluding comments. Number one, the team and I have already discussed the need to work to restore, restore trust. Frankly, I do not know how to navigate through a crisis or significant challenge without it. We have discussed a number of strategies to do just this, with the first being our commitment to look not to what information we can avoid sharing with legal justifications, but instead, what is the most amount of meaningful data that we can share within our legal constraints. I am so proud that in this spirit, Tracy and other members of the team have already published a dashboard of cases at West Ada School District Schools on the website and are committed to doing more soon as we can. Second, the team and I have also discussed the need for enhanced communications in order to build that trust and manage through this unprecedented and rapidly evolving time with less aggravation and frustration. Already in our first week, the team put together a webinar with teachers for me to answer their questions. In alignment with our commitment to greater transparency, a recording of that webinar was posted to the website and made available to all those teachers who were unable to join us at the time, but also to any parents who would like to listen to it. Third, the disease transmission in our communities is rising to record levels. This puts tremendous pressure on our schools, not because as of yet that we are dealing with significant transmission within the schools, but because with such high levels in our communities, this means that there are more and more staff, teachers, and students, statistically speaking, coming into our schools infected. And of course, this is the ultimate stress test on our operational plans to keep those cases isolated and sporadic, rather than becoming clusters and ultimately outbreaks that would then force one or more of our schools to go remote. Therefore, I implore parents to be our partners in helping us keep schools open. We understand that this is a time of deep political and ideological division, and we regret that. But we all have a common goal, keeping our kids in schools and doing so safely. Even if there are parents who are not concerned about the risks of infection to their children or to their families, we still need to recognize the importance of all of us not engaging in risky behaviors for the remainder of the school year. Because even if a parent does not have these concerns, if we have high numbers of cases, teachers may not feel safe. We all realize that it does no good to have classrooms if we don't have teachers in those classrooms. And further, for those parents who are not concerned about the risks to their children or their own families, failing to follow the public health guidance at home in the evenings and on the weekends only increases the chances that more children will be infected and even if asymptomatic could be the cause of a cluster or an outbreak that would at least end up in many other students who also want to be in school having to quarantine for two weeks, but if the asymptomatic student infected enough students, could even result in the entire school having to go remote. So I again plead for the support of parents as partners in this effort. I think we all want the same thing. My last comment, finally, Idaho and many other states, including our neighbors in Utah and Montana, are experiencing severe threats to our hospital capacity. I leave it for another occasion to expound on the very dangerous risks if our hospital capacity in Idaho is exceeded. But I raise this point to make clear that schools could do everything well and 
everything right according to our operations plan and yet be ordered to go remote if the disease activity continues its rise and we have many hospitals overwhelmed and clearly several are on the brink. The best thing we can do to help avoid this outcome, we need to exercise distancing and wearing face coverings, not only during school, but in our activities outside of school. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Pate, for that uh, very uh, thorough uh, presentation. Do any trustees have questions for Dr. Pate? Uh, Trustee Klaffenstein. Thank you very much, Chairman. Appreciate that. Um, Dr. Pate, thank you very much for all your work. We truly appreciate uh, everything you're doing for the district. Um, I just had two questions. One, um, obviously one of the weaknesses, and I think you even mentioned this in some of your notes, was one of the weaknesses might be the, um, uh, the gathering and reporting of our numbers and understanding what those cases look like. Uh, obviously, if we don't have accurate numbers, we can't truly understand what our outbreak situation looks like. So I was just hoping to hear your perspective about what is um, the district's ability to gather those numbers accurately and suggested changes you might have to adjust that system and improve it. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Trustee. Um, I have not had an opportunity yet to dive into the data gathering and reporting process to understand uh, what ways that might be enhanced. Uh, we've been focused on these other things because of how uh, timely are, these are, but we will get to that. I just haven't had a chance to look at that issue yet. So thank you very much. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing I was curious about also is there was, there's a large concern among teachers for in-person. Yes. Um, and we've been looking at, um, I think, <clears throat> for the past several weeks, actually, uh, a sister district of ours in Utah called the Alpine School District. Some parents had introduced that to us and been talking to administrators over there. And it seemed as though their K through three, K through five, literally unaffected or very low number of infections. Um, could you talk about, is there a difference, and I've read this in the, uh, the, uh, the pediatrics literature, is there a difference between children under 10 in terms of uh, the safety we would be expecting for teachers versus over 10. Is that really a, um, is that something that teachers can expect to have a little bit level of protection just because of age? Y yes, thank you, trustee. Um, so I would say that uh, the data so far, and I, and I want to just offer a, a caution because a lot of the data that we have is from particularly like over the summer. And uh, you may be aware that uh, not every place in the world, but many schools across the world all closed around the time that we did back in March. Some reopened earlier than we did, and we c have been able to look at those. Uh, and But none opened with the kind of disease activity levels that we have. So, so in essence, this is an experiment. And my caution is that as we now have more kids in school, we get more experience across our entire country, it is possible the data could, uh, could change. And it could change as the activity, uh, the disease transmission rates in the community changes and increases. I'm hoping we can get that stopped. Or it is possible that co-infection, which we know can occur with other respiratory viruses and influenza, could change the transmission characteristics. However, based on what we know today, you're correct. There appears to be a, uh, an age range of around 10 to 12 where the transmission characteristics change. Below that, children tend not to be as efficient in transmitting it. That's not to say they can't transmit it. We know they can, but your chances of being infected with being in proximity to a seven-year-old would likely be less than being in proximity with a 15-year-old. And so that is how it appears today. So I think the 
uh, I think we have to continue to watch that and make sure that's what's playing out. As I mentioned, that is what's playing out in our data so far. And again, not peculiar to Idaho. That is a trend we are seeing across the country. Um, and, but we need to watch to see if that changes. But for right now, we believe that the risk of clusters, outbreaks, and infections to, ch to teachers in the school is less for elementary than it would be for middle and high school. I do not mean to suggest in anybody's mind that that should mean let's throw caution to the wind with elementary school. I think we still need to take precautions. However, I certainly have heard from teachers, it is more difficult to keep those elementary school children distanced at all times, uh, particularly recess and other things. We will look at creative ways to do that, and I've already put feelers out, and I've asked the team to do so with their networks to see who's doing innovative things and creative things to help keep the little ones uh, distance. But I think our, our focus, given that we have, we're in the bad situation we are as a state in terms of our transmission, we've got to focus on the highest risk first. And so we've got to make sure that we're really getting this down as, as precisely as we can in high schools and then in, in uh, middle schools. For elementary schools, right now, my focus uh, and where I would be content for the moment, if we can keep those kids distanced in the classroom and if we can keep them distanced when they're eating, I will be very satisfied for the time being. Then we can look to make incremental improvements, but right now I think those should be the focuses. Thank you very much. Thank really you. Appreciate it. Sherman, thank you. That's all I have. Trustee Azuna. Dr. Pate, I truly appreciate the time that you've spent with our team and reviewing our plans. I wanted to follow up on what um, Trustee Klopfenstein was asking related to elementary kids and specifically if there's something special about the the 10 year age. And, and what I really want to understand is the plan that's coming in front of us tonight has a difference between K through three and our fourth and fifth graders. Do we need to look at our fourth and fifth graders differently or can we consider all of elementary at this time in one plan and make adjustments if needed based on what we see in our schools? It's a great question, uh, Trustee. Um, first of all, uh, I would tell you with all of these statistics, uh, you know, we talk about the six feet of distance. That does not mean that at five feet, 11 inches, you are now at some significant increased risk than if you were six foot one inch. This is all kind of a gradation. Uh, and the same thing for this ages. That does not mean that a, there might be some kids in that middle zone that could be effective, maybe, because uh, we don't understand exactly why that is. There are some theories, but we don't know. Maybe it's a bigger kid. Maybe it's a kid doing a, particularly a lot of shouting and yelling in the schools. I mean, there, there are things that could affect that. So I think a couple of things. The younger you are going down, clearly, the more likely you are to be asymptomatic, the less likely you are to be seriously affected, unless you get into that first year. Uh, and it appears that the very young, now these aren't going to be in your schools, actually have higher viral loads. Usually we correlate that with greater contagiousness. That does not seem to be the case with this virus. And the theory is, they don't have as effective coughs, and so they're not transmitting this as well. We don't know, and as I said, again, I don't know what difference that will make if you now give that kid a co-infection with a, one of the respiratory viruses that causes croup. Now maybe you change those characteristics. Um, so to answer your question, I do think we can, for the moment, until we have other evidence, either in our own numbers, or in our experience, or in the, in the clinical studies, we can look at elementary as being better positioned than middle schools and high schools. If you said, 
that in abundance of caution, you only wanted to have, for example, K to three, I, I certainly wouldn't argue with you, but I don't see a compelling reason at this point why we can't look at elementary school in block. One additional question. Um, thank you for that. That's very helpful. S some of the concerns that I hear from staff are that when you go in to do the audits or, you know, when Central District Health comes in to look at our classrooms, that we might show you the best case scenarios. Mm -hmm. Um, what I really, what, what I truly want you to see are where we have problems and where we need to make changes. How can you reassure our staff that you're really going to see through our best case scenarios and identify where the gaps are at? And yeah, give it's them a some great question. And, and, and of course, this goes back to a statement I made that the team and I have discussed, and that is we have to build trust. Uh, and so at the foundation, this is a trust issue and, and we have to repair that and I think we can. It's going to take some time. We're going to have to be consistent and we're going to show it, but it will take time, but I think that can be repaired for the time being. Um, I, I understand the concerns of the teachers. A couple of things. One, it's much harder to fake this than you think. Uh, and I have a long experience. Really what I'm doing is applying principles that we've learned in the healthcare industry to how we would do this. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, in healthcare settings, in hospitals, we have many policies and procedures that people are to follow. Uh, and like most things in life, it's not perfect. People don't follow them perfectly. However, with the kind of uh, audit system that I put in place back in Houston and then doing the same thing here, I, we found stuff all the time. It, it's very hard to fake it. Most of the time, people won't even know that we're auditing, but even when they do, we still see the stuff. It, it's going to be very hard to deceive us. You might make it look a little bit better. You might be able to take some precautions, but you're not going to hide. You're not going to be successful in hiding fundamental non-compliance with our policies. We're going to see it. Now, if, as we get further through this process, we are surprised ourselves that, for example, uh, we are looking at a school and we're getting all great evidence of compliance, but yet we're seeing cases, we're going to know there's something, you know, something's not right and we can go look at it. The other thing is once we get this in place, if, if in talking to teachers, if they are still concerned about this, and I could understand if they were, then I will discuss with the team whether I or others could have permission to do some unannounced visits where we would go and look without warning or notice to the local school leadership. And I, I can assure you, uh, even at schools I've gone to to do walkthroughs today that knew I was coming, they were ready, they're very proud of their schools, they want to show it off, I find plenty. Uh, so I, I hope that won't be the case, but we will be very transparent, very clear, and if our teachers are still reporting that what we're seeing is not matching up to what they're seeing, then I assure you I will certainly make the recommendations to the team necessary to give them that confidence. It's essential. And, and this is in everybody's best interest. It is not, and one thing that we've learned in healthcare, this is not punitive. This is not a process where we want to go and find problems so that we can chastise somebody or, or write them up. That's not effective. It's the whole thing has to be an opportunity to get better. And we all should want that. And because I don't think any of that school leadership wants to have an outbreak at their school, and which would clearly show that they weren't probably doing their job. And they need the teachers there. The teachers have to have confidence that we're doing everything that is reasonable to assure their safety. And we will not give up until we achieve all of that. 
Any other trustees? Trustee Johnson. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm kind of afraid to ask this question, but it's a question that's been on my mind for eight months. Can we legitimately get all kids back in school safely, in your opinion? Uh, today, no. No, I, I now, I, I want to caution uh, about my remarks. Uh, one may not appreciate how many hours of my time have already gone into this in just the hour and a week. There are no extra hours for me to get out and look at schools today. That will come, but in order to get the things that we've gotten prepared for you today, I've been having to work full time at this. So I haven't seen the schools. I, the possibility is I could be pleasantly surprised. I doubt that's the case because both teachers and administration are telling me there are instances where we are not successfully distancing even today. So if we can't do that today, and we're going to look and see if there's some other ideas about how we could do that, but if we can't do it today, and that's with some of the class remote, some of the class out quarantined, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, the hybrid, um, if we can't do that, and it, uh, then we can't go full in person. Now, once we go and look and say we've really got this down and we're doing great and we are keeping kids distance and we have figured out the tricks and the ways that teachers and school leaders can keep those kids distance throughout the day and we're not having problems absolutely we can look at are there opportunities for kids that their parents want them to be in school is there a way to accommodate that and there's a lot of education issues that I don't know about whether that could impact that decision. And conversely, we also have to be prepared for the situation that teachers or students who were not high risk at the beginning of the school year may become high risk. And we will also have to explore what are the opportunities to allow them to get out of the classroom setting. So, We'll certainly look at all those things, but based on what I know today, there is no way to accomplish full in-person uh, schools, and it just would not be advisable today. That helps some. I, I have a couple, I maybe follow up on that. But let me ask a little bit. Um, when we talk about, I think about the classroom structure, right? Yeah. And if we go, we have more than one opportunity for, for social distancing now. We have actual social distancing, and then we have a pod structure, which now has been put into play, which I don't know if we really understood what that means, what, what that meant like six weeks ago. But you had said in your comments that we cannot pod in middle and high school. Was there a reason behind that statement? I would like to understand that. Yes, thank you, Trustee. Um, again, uh, I'm early in my evaluation process and I still have much to learn, but my understanding is that in elementary schools, we can preserve the pods. In other words, uh, if we uh, had a classroom here that was in pods, the key thing to being successful is keeping the pods physically distanced. In elementary school, my understanding is that the kids don't have to move to a lot of different classrooms, a lot of uh, different uh, mix with kids that those pods can be preserved. Now, we will check to see if that's a true statement. Um, however, what I understand as of right now is that in middle school and probably particularly high school that uh, the kids do have to change classrooms, classmates, maybe, uh, uh, and I don't understand this in detail, but maybe some kids are taking a class that other kids aren't. And the question is, how could you keep that pod potted all day? Uh, and my understanding is that would be logistically difficult in uh, middle and high school. 
uh, understand again a comment that I made in my remarks. A pod is a last resort. A pod is not ideal. The ideal situation is and should always be keeping every individual student distanced. However, in those situations where the assistant superintendent and the local school leaders and myself cannot come up with any alternative way of how to keep those students distanced and there are uh, 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 too many students for that room of parents that want the students to be in person that we can't keep them distance, then you can look at the pod situation. And the reason that that is not what we strive for is when you create a pod, what you are saying is we are going to intentionally create close contacts. That is not advisable. It is a way to do it, but it is not advisable because now those kids have the risk of whatever the other kids in their pod. And that's the other reason why I say keep those as small as we can. What would be necessary in order and only the minimum necessary in order to keep those pods physically distanced. I think that helps. Where, where I'm really struggling, and it's been the, it, I, it feels like a tale as old as time. It's only been for COVID, but it feels like a <laughs> Disney nightmare, um, is that we're really focused on the COVID safety. And there's a risk factor there, and we're trying to minimize that risk factor. We also have an equally challenging risk factor when it comes to kids in education. And where I'm struggling is where, to, where that balancing line is at because we could be very successful in the COVID risk. And mm -hmm. you know, if I listen to what's coming at me right now in all sorts of different verbal, um, the educational risk, we're not, we're not successful right now. In our hybrid model, we're not successful. In our remote model, in many situations. So we're losing on the education risk side. So where I'm most concerned is how do we balance those two? Because we may, we may have to accept a little more risk here in order to make sure that we bring the detriment that we're causing right now in remote and hybrid. And those are not just West Ada statistics. I don't have any actually assessment data at West Ada right now. I haven't seen any. That's national statistics. So how do we balance those risks? And I think you're going to give us good risks from the medical side, right? Correct. But we also need to have good data from, and we've got some now on our own students and how well they're passing, where their assessments are at, what their risk levels are before we can really make a good decision around what's the best way to operate and we need to be able to balance those. Yeah. Given, and, and, oh, oh, I'm sorry, did you want me to respond to that? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay, yeah. well, uh, Trustee, I, th I think you're bringing a very good point and I want to be clear and emphasize a point that you just made. Um, I have no expertise in the field of education, none. Uh, and I, I've merely been a recipient of it. I, I don't know, uh, uh, anything about what are the best ways and effective measures to uh, teach children. I, what I'm under the impression is that there are some virtual programs that are good for some kids. And I understand from the superintendent and others that have quite a bit of experience and expertise in education that for many children, and particularly those younger, it's really important for them to be in person. Um, I'm in no position to be able to quantify and balance those risks for you. Uh, I just don't have the expertise to do so. And it's also why I have said publicly many times, I don't think doctors should be making this decision for you. Whether you open schools, whether you uh, don't, uh, how you do it, uh, doctors shouldn't be doing that. We, we're not in a position to be able to weigh that. I can advise you what we know about the medical risks. I would also add, it's even hard for you to balance those with what I'm telling you, because we don't even understand all of the medical risks yet. Uh, because schools were out for so long, we believe that transmission in children was way down. So 
you know, once, once we started seeing schools reopen, we did start seeing a lot more cases in, in kids, but that's been recent. And so we actually don't know. There's a number of things that we see in adults, and we're not sure whether we're going to see those in kids. That doesn't always work the same. And there is a peculiar condition that we see in children that we have not yet seen in adults. So I think we have much to learn, and we will learn, and probably we could have a conversation maybe around January, and I'll be much more knowledgeable and informed to be able to tell you a better quantification of what those risks are. But, um, but you're quite right. You have a very difficult job of trying to weigh risks, uh, and there's all kinds of risks in this decision and factors in this decision, when most of those uh, can't even be quantified for you. Uh, uh, you know, I, there may be some things that the educators know and can tell you. I think what you're going to have to do is I can advise you what we know about medical, they can advise you what they know about education, and then you can try, but I'm not sure that either one of us will be able to fully quantify that for you. Thank you. I had one um, last question, and it really had to do with some, another comment you had said, and I want to understand it better. And it was around not getting out of sync with the public health district. Yes. And uh, um, I'll be honest, this feels, uh, not your comment, the whole way the public health district is operated has felt really messy um, statewide. And I'm not blaming anybody. Nobody's, there's no playbook for COVID. So um, maybe somebody had it. I haven't seen it yet. I'll take it if they've got it. Yeah. But um, so I'm trying to understand what, what do we need to stay in sync with? What is important to stay in sync with? And where do we, you know, go to our district? What's that line? Or is there something when you said that that you had a, in sure. mind? No, it's a great question, Trustee. So um, the reason that I felt it was important for me to run my recommendations uh, through Central District Health is, first of all, I do not have access to a whole lot of data. Uh, I do not have personal access to the specifics of contact tracing and what are they seeing now i know at a high level because i get reports by virtue of the fact that i sit on the governor's coronavirus work group i get reports of generalities of what we're seeing around the state in terms of transmission but what i do not have access to is the detailed uh, uh, case numbers uh, case uh, descriptions uh, if this student got infected, was it through school? Was it at home? Uh, how did it happen? I don't have access to any of that. So, uh, and they rightly are not sharing that with me. They will share some blinded information with me so that I can't tell what we're talking about, but I'm not getting enough data that I would want to substitute my judgment for theirs. So that's the first thing is I want to make sure that there's not something they're seeing that I'm not aware of and nobody is aware of. The second thing is that, uh, and I'm not quite even sure of where the various lines of authority lie uh, with this board versus the Central District Health as to who could order what. Uh, and so I think to the extent that we can stay in sync, that's advantageous to everybody. I think what I hear from teachers is they are frustrated by hearing this is what we're gonna use and this is how we're gonna move forward and then we change it. I don't wanna do that to them if I can help that. And so if I came forward with a proposal for you and we did that tonight and then Central District Health is listening in on a call and tomorrow they say we won't accept that and we might do something different we're not in a good place uh, and then uh, uh, a third is that um, this is really challenging uh, it's very difficult if there comes a point there hasn't so far but if there comes a point where central district health is saying one thing and either the leadership team or this board is saying something different, 
I, if the superintendent wants me to, then I can engage in discussions with both parties to try to understand where they are and see if I can reconcile that. But if there is something Central District Health is saying that I do not agree with and I agree with you or the team about, I will be happy if the superintendent invites me to do so to come here and explain to you why I either agree with you or why I agree with Central District Health. Right now, I think we need to consider everybody's guidance and see what's the best collective thought to move forward. Mr. Chair, just a final comment. I, um, I wrote down two things. You said that I think we've all echoed at different times and I really appreciate um, you and the leadership team taking these to the top of the level, and that is rebuilding the trust and communication. So yeah. thank you. Well, you're most welcome. And I just want to uh, reemphasize, you know, uh, I, I have not encountered anyone on either any sides, and there shouldn't be sides, but I haven't encountered anyone that hasn't been of goodwill. And I think people are trying and trying very hard. I am extremely empathetic to teachers. I know this isn't what they signed up for, and I know from being a healthcare worker, I'd be concerned about my families too. Uh, I get that totally. I also am empathetic with professional educators who think we do need to find ways to have kids in school. I think we can strike the right balance, but we can't do that until we are really communicating well and being transparent so that everybody understands. And that will be my objective. Uh, that's hard when there's a lot of drama and frustrations and, and you feel like maybe you're going to get beat up for what you say. We've got, to, we've got to repair that. The good thing is, even though that might be hard to hear, the leadership team has completely embraced that and totally agreed to essentially everything that I have recommended and advised. So I think the prognosis is extremely good. Any other trustee questions? Trustee Smiley, do you have anything? I, I just have one quick question, Dr. Pate. Um, and you kind of alluded to this with respect to mass, but is there data, I mean, it'd be stuff that transcends Ada County, clearly showing that these measures make a difference in the school setting? That, I mean, is there, are there data sets saying, well, if you've got classrooms that, that are full on versus classrooms that would be, you know, half and you've got hopefully, you know, six feet of distance, that there is a difference in transmission? Or, I mean, I've, I've seen some of the data from the New England Journal of Medicine with, with respect to mass, but I'm, I'm thinking, but that isn't in a school setting. Is there, are there data sets with regards to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is an evolving field. We, uh, surprisingly, here we are in 2020, and there hasn't been a lot of data on masks. In fact, healthcare professionals and public health officials have actually been surprised by some of the data ha that has come out uh, for, uh, through the study of masks. Of course, prior to this pandemic, uh, there weren't a lot of people willing to fund research on masks. It just wasn't a big deal. So there's a lot of research going on right now. I would say that I don't know of any research specific to the West Ada School District, but there certainly are studies and uh, data available that seem clear and convincing. I think we can argue about the degree of protection, but I don't think there's a legitimate argument that the masks aren't protective. The, what we need to keep in mind is there, as I mentioned in my report, there are three manners of transmission of this virus. So masks are not all equal, they're not equally effective for all three modes. The most effective masks are, and again, we could debate, it would be reasonable to debate the degree of protection. Uh, I think most experts think it's in the 80 plus percent uh, range of protecting from droplet transmission. And, and that is a matter of 
the respiratory droplets, these little uh, liquids that if you had put up a mirror here in front of me while I was talking to you, if I didn't have a mask on, little droplets of liquid be, would be adhering to that mirror and you could see that. Those, those droplets, if I'm infected, will contain virus. And what we have seen from studies is uh, those droplets go out for a distance. Most of them will only travel within three feet of me. Uh, and they will land on this desk and they will land on the floor there. However, uh, there are situations where you can easily transmit on the order of six feet. My raising my voice, projecting as a teacher would in a classroom to, to uh, talk to people that are seated at a distance, that will project more virus in the droplets and for a further distance. So the six feet isn't in stone, but it is, it is certainly where the vast majority of these droplets go. The mask is effective by actually these droplets don't get past the mask as well as if you're not wearing a mask. So it helps to just decrease that risk. The second source of transmission is airborne. We understand a lot less about that. The difference between airborne, and people get confused because droplets go in the air, as I just mentioned, but what we're talking about uh, uh, airborne would be really more of the analogy if I was spraying deodorant or hairspray, the aerosols here. And what would happen is they move on airstreams. Uh, and so it's, that is exactly how if someone in the back was smoking a cigar, you'd eventually know it. It's because that smoke would get transmitted in the airstreams here. And we do know the virus can transmit on air, it can be carried in these airstreams and it can go much further. And that is why now what I recommend to the schools is if you're outdoors, and you can maintain the six feet of distance, you can have mass breaks because we know those airstreams are not the same outside as they are indoors. However, indoors in the building, students should have appropriate face coverings on and, uh, and, and all the staff and teachers as well, as long as they're in the building because the virus can transmit on airstreams. We don't know how common it is for people to be infected by these aerosols. We know that it happens. We have really good evidence of this actually happening in a restaurant of people seated way more than six feet apart being infected by somebody at another table because of the airstream. And we also believe that the uh, airborne transmission is a big factor in the super spreader events. And we know that those typically occur indoors, typically occur when people are not wearing masks. We got very good news that where I was saying with the droplets, the masks are probably uh, in excess of 80% protective. We didn't know that they were gonna be effective for aerosols. They appear to be 65% effective for that in decreasing aerosols. So that's, it's an important tool, but it's not gonna give us absolute protection. But certain activities. If we were to bring the cheerleaders in here to do a cheer, that would be highly dangerous because that kind of yelling transmits the virus very effectively. If we brought one of your choirs in to sing before this, very dangerous because those are the settings where you can transmit this in the airstreams. And those are the cases, unlike the droplets, that typically only infect one or two other people, if they even infect anybody, the aerosols, the airborne, could infect large numbers of people that are in the same space. So yes, we have good, but certainly not perfect data about the effectiveness of face masks. And of course, they don't help hardly at all for the contact mode of transmission.
Well, thank you. If no one else has anything else, thank you, Dr. Pate. Thank you. That brings us to discussion item number two, which are options for remote learning language in yellow and red. And I suspect Mr. Hellers or Dr. Rannells. Thank you, Chairman Newhoff, trustees. On behalf of the West Ada School District, I would like to thank Dr. Pate for his countless hours and expertise in guiding us through the evaluation process. In addition, would like to thank Dr. Peterman, Dr. Nemerson, Dr. Sousa, and Dr. Nasser for providing their valuable insight and information to Dr. Pate, which was compiled in his report. After reading hundreds of emails and listening to teachers, staff, parents, students, and administrators across the district, after contacting other school districts to see what they are doing, that is working and what isn't working. After hundreds of hours partnering with Central District Health and after receiving feedback and guidance from these medical professionals, we have been able to identify some common ground. Number one, as professional educators, we know the importance of in-person learning, especially for our younger students and for those with special needs. Number two, Increasing our vigilance in implementing and monitoring safety protocols will continue to be a priority. We have to take care of our teachers and staff so they can take care of our kids. Number three, decisions based on school by school data should be a primary source for considering what happens in terms of closing a program, a classroom, or a school. And number four, the process for contact tracing, notification, and isolation must be transparent and consistent. During this portion of the agenda, we will be sharing changes to our plan recommended by the COVID task force. As you all know, there are 42 individuals who've been meeting multiple hours since March 13. I am grateful to this group for their commitment to finding solutions, their focus on keeping kids and staff safe, and engaging in very healthy debates while remaining professional. The following summarizes the major points we are recommending based on all of the information we have at hand. Number one, health and safety. All schools, programs, and classrooms will continue utilizing health and safety protocols and mitigating measures. Our focus will be on improving practices for social distancing and wearing proper face coverings properly. We are aware that some classrooms are challenged with implementing effective distancing. Our goal will be on identifying those classrooms that are unable to physically distance and problem solve as to how to achieve adequate distancing. We may discover creative answers. We may discover it simply is not possible. Number two, schedule for learning. Based on teacher requests for additional planning time, but still wanting face-to-face -face instruction, the task force is proposing the following schedule for learning. For grades K through three, school operations beginning on November 10th, that we would have daily in-person instruction with an early release on Mondays. For grades four through five, starting on November 10th, we would recommend an alternating day in-person instruction with early release Mondays. In addition, team one attends in-person on Tuesday and Thursday and every other Monday Team two attends in person on Wednesday and Friday and every other Monday. The task force was clear. They wanted to maintain the schedule that would allow equal access for face-to-face -face instruction. Grades six through 12, beginning on November 10th, would have an alternating day in-person instruction with remote learning Mondays. Team one and two would participate in remote learning on Monday. Team one would attend in person on Tuesday and Thursday, and team two would attend in person on Wednesday and Friday. 
Regarding our decision-making process, decisions regarding any type of closure will be based on data school by school. For example, if there are a few confirmed cases and a need to quarantine staff and students who have been exposed at any one of our schools, but there are no other cases related to or impacted by this school at any of the other schools, keeping the other schools open would make sense. Our experience since the beginning of school have helped us develop a robust process for contact tracing. The district data dashboard will be an integral tool in identifying cases. This is an element of our proposal. We know Dr. Pate and the medical professionals can help us improve and use in a consistent manner. Auditing health and safety. As Dr. Pate mentioned, it is imperative in partnership with Central District Health that we begin a process for, for auditing health and safety standards in each of our buildings. We know already there are four areas from Dr. Pate's work concerning an emphasis. And those four areas include social distancing, recess, lunch, and students with special needs. We know this will be an ongoing pr process throughout the remainder of the year. We are demonstrating that the practices are mitigating the spread of the virus. Again, we need to take good care of our teachers and our staff so they can take care of our kids. The other thing we've painfully come to realize is that change is a constant. What we decide today, how the board would like to move us forward, we know will not be the same at the end of the school year or perhaps even at, at the beginning of the new year. Things will change and we need to be fluid. This has been the lesson we have repeatedly learned, but we believe the changes to our plan reflect today's current reality. The board has a difficult decision to make this evening and we are aware of that and are here to help and assist in any way we can. Our greatest challenge will be how do we stand together when there are so many diverse opinions and demands? Perhaps we could do what West Data has always done well. We stay focused on kids and we take care of one another. Those are the biggest changes to our plan that we know will take considerable time and effort. Our staff is here to answer any detailed questions you might have. Mr. Chairman, trustees, uh, we're at your service. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Was there, Mr. Heller, did you have something you wanted to present as well? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, trustees. I would like to just take a few minutes and just go through a few slides. Much of it's going to reiterate what you heard both from Dr. Pate and from Dr. Rannells uh, this evening. Um, our recommendation again is to transition to the use of positive cases within, in, within our individual schools, programs, and classrooms to inform our operational response. And as Dr. Rannells said, the response would be specific to the circumstances of the cases within that specific school, program, classroom, and or pod. The why behind that, as was laid out already, is that Central District Health and several medical experts have been pleased that there is no clear and significant evidence that infections in school-aged children are contributing to the level of community spread at this time. We believe that our criteria requires flexibility because transmission of the infection is not uniform throughout all of our schools. And we believe it is inappropriate to have a criterion that may require the closure of all of our schools, even if some are operating safely and not contributing to the level of community spread. This slide indicates the, th the same information that Dr. Randall's laid out previously, which is grades K through three daily in person with an early release on Mondays, grades four through five alternating day in person with early release on Mondays, and grades six through 12 alternating day in person with remote learning on Mondays. I did wanna point out um, some questions have come forward in terms of why four and five look different than what than K through three. And I think there's a number of reasons. One I would point out is if you look at within our policy, 
the maximum cap of, of classroom size in K through three reaches a t a, the height of 26 students per class, whereas grades four and five are capped at 32. I would say those six extra students do make an, a lot of difference when you're trying to physically distance students within that classroom. So that is one of the primary reasons why that um, decision and based on our COVID task force, the elementary principals within the COVID task force, they felt that four and five was the area they were the, where they were most challenged to meet the physical distancing um, within the elementary levels. Yes, yeah, so in, in a minute, I'll have Tracy Garner um, come up and talk through process in terms of how do we go about contact tracing? How will we identify where the clusters are, where the outbreaks are, so that we can make the decisions school by school? So I'll, she'll come up and talk through that. But I would, at this moment, stand for any questions on um, these changes in general that, you, that we're kind of putting in front of you tonight. So do any trustees have questions for Mr. Heller or Dr. Annals with regards to this? Trustee Johnson? Mr. Chair, actually, if you don't mind, I, I want to be able to hear all of it before we ask questions. Is that a problem, or would you prefer us to go one by one? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So, Mrs. Garner? Good evening, Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Reynolds. It's my pleasure to be here uh, to talk to you about the COVID process, um, which includes contact tracing, how West Ada has been conducting this process um, in hopes to instill some trust um, in what we've been doing, what we've been finding, and some of the numbers and data that we've had. So we'll go through this process. First of all, the COVID process includes four areas. Uh, and, and I should start by thanking the nurses and the health techs that work for the district. Um, I have an amazing team that I get to work for. Uh, we have 50 staff members. Uh, their lives have turned upside down in um, implementing a new, new processes a new disease and ensuring the safety of their staff and students within their buildings. They've embraced this with much professionalism. They've been working a lot of hours and the majority of their hours are focusing on COVID and COVID-like processes while trying to manage chronic illnesses with our students, trying to ensure students with medical needs are being able to access education equally. Um, and ensuring those students with acute injuries or illnesses and or staff are being attended to as well. So it's been quite an undertaking, but they've embraced this with a lot of uh, humility, with a lot of um, professionalism, and I'm really proud to work with such a great group. So thank you to the health services staff. Um, our COVID-like processes include um, looking at COVID-like symptoms. We believe that since um, individuals can be infectious two days before the onset of symptoms, that it's imperative that we are screening for symptoms and removing those individuals from the school environment. Um, if you look at the data, I think that our aggressive approach to um, keeping people home when they have symptoms is um, demonstrating and working well in the mitigating measures to prevent the spread. Second, while awaiting COVID test results for yourself or your household members. Um, we have processes in place for that, which we'll talk about. We have no in close contacts or an exposure to a COVID positive person. And then we have how we deal with positive cases. So we'll go through some of those. COVID-like symptoms. Please don't come to school or work. Uh, CDH will say, if you're in yellow, stay home until you're symptom free or improved without medications for 24 hours. When you're in red, you quarantine for 14 days. Uh, this is the, the seriousness and the intent of focusing on symptoms and making sure that we don't have people in the workplace environment or in our school environment who may be sick or exhibiting symptoms. Number two, if you're waiting for COVID test results for yourself, you need to quarantine while waiting for those test results. If you uh, get your test results and you're positive, you quarantine for 10 days from the onset of symptoms or the test date. And if you're negative, we need to know why did you test? Was it related to an exposure or a symptom? And then we'll follow the CDH's provided decision tree on either exposure or illness symptoms. 
it's important to note that you cannot test out of an exposure. Um, if you have had a no one co uh, contact, you need to quarantine for the entire 14 days. You could test out of symptoms. And Dr. Pate will look forward to uh, your medical expertise in helping us define and further clarify some of those uh, medical situations with regards to testing that was stated doesn't have um, access to because we're not a medical provider, but have been doing a great job gleaning and learning that information from the community. But I welcome your input into that. COVID awaiting test results. Household members, all household members at West State are being asked to quarantine while we're waiting for the household members' test results to return. If they're positive, they're quarantined for the duration of the positive person's isolation. If they're able to isolate from the positive members within the household, you may return 14 days from the last exposure. If you're unable to isolate from the positive member in your household, you may return 14 days after the positive person's quarantine has ended. And yes, that could be 24 plus days uh, for individuals quarantining within a household with a positive member. This has a direct impact on our students and their access to education. And again, we're looking forward to welcoming Dr. Pate and the medical community um, to provide us with some insights. We're also very closely looking at data, the nurses and the health services team, as to when we have those positives and when we're quarantining, what type of conversion rates are we looking at? If you're negative or your household member's negative, they, you may return to work. A COVID known exposure, you quarantine for 14 days from last known close contact to the exposure of the positive person. COVID positive cases, if you're a positive individual, you quarantine for 10 days from onset of symptoms, and then we begin contact tracing. Um, a little bit of background, um, I've been uh, involved in risk management since 1995. Risk management involves conducting a lot of investigations. This is not new to me on how to conduct investigations. COVID's new, but conducting investigations isn't necessarily new. Um, as well as um, we'll talk about some of the nurses and their experience with regards to this. So contact tracing, what is that? Well, we're identifying our close contacts, those within six feet for longer than cumulative 15 minutes in a 24 hour period. And we're identifying those close contacts and then we're quarantining them ideally within 48 hours. One of the areas that we've improved with our process is that originally CDH was requesting and requiring that we receive um, confirmation of a positive case before we began um, identifying the close contacts and quarantining them. We've recently, with the backlog in the community and recognizing how um, busy CDH is, it's very hard to get back to us with confirmation of a positive case. And we've moved ahead uh, recognizing that that lag could impact our numbers, we've moved ahead with um, identifying those close contacts and quarantining them sooner um, than waiting for that uh, confirmation from CDH. So we're constantly looking at performance improvement and how we can do things better. Contact tracing, why do we do it? Well, we want to contact trace so we can prevent the spread. Um, it's important that our kids be in school, in-person learning, and um, if we take an aggressive re approach to the contact tracing and preventing the spread, we're allowing our kids to be in school and creating a safe environment for student and staff. Um, we talked a little bit already about infectious for 48 hours prior to developing symptoms or testing positive. That's key to know. If people are looking at data and looking at positive cases as the step or the measure as to when to protect themselves, they're too late. You need to be following the mitigating measures at all times. Um, waiting until you see a positive case in your community or your school, you've missed, you've missed it. You should be taking the measures before. I see you nodding, thank you. <laughs> um, recognizing that it's imperative that we ensure our mitigating measures are in place and the impact of this, the physical distancing, the wearing the masks, the washing your hands. Contact tracing who? health services. We talked about our school nurses. 
School nurses have been doing contact tracing on communicable diseases for years. Um, we've worked with CDH with regards to uh, scabies cases, uh, pertussis is a common one that comes about every year, measles, chickenpox, uh, those cases come up every year at various schools, and we work with CDH doing the contact tracing to ensure the safety of those within the school environment. With regards to COVID-related, re we've been doing this since March. Uh, this summer, um, I was intimately involved, calling parents, students, staff on weekends, multiple hours. Um, this is what we do. Um, our school health techs have come on board and are learning the process. I'm very pleased and thankful for our principals. Um, our principals have embraced this and have started in, um, engaging in the con um, contact tracing process. I have principals that will go into the class environments. Um, when we get a positive case, they'll go meet with teachers, they'll look at seating charts, they'll look at the seating configurations, they'll identify if there's um, any physical distancing gaps, they'll talk about mask wearing, whether the individuals or all individuals were wearing their masks, how consistent, um, and then uh, they do a lot of follow-up and performance improvement. So huge thank you to, um, excuse me, our principals um, for the work that they're doing and engaging in the contact tracing process. Um, our SPED director, uh, Ramona Lee, and her staff have been very instrumental in um, the contact tracing with regards to individuals that are in our special ed programs to include students and staff. When they test positive, they participate in the contact tracing so that they can look at it from how do we make um, program improvements. Transportation is involved. They provide us again with seating charts. They provide us with surveillance of the bus so that we can look at the videotape, identify the positive individual, and notify those that were in close contact. Remember, all of this is occurring within 48 hours. Um, our food and nutrition supervisor, um, if there's any involvement with food and nutrition personnel, our food and nutrition um, is trained. She's doing contact um, tracing with regards to her staff. Um, and quarantining, same with our custodian and maintenance staff. So again, thank you to all those individuals. They're participating in a very robust contact tracing to make sure that we get a full picture of close contacts and that they're quarantined within the school environments. It takes a team and we've got a really great team here that's doing a lot of great work. Um, and then CDH, CDH works with us um, they're providing guidance, education, tools, information, and additional understanding from what they glean from the um, virus. So very thankful to have a great uh, partner with CDH. So our contact tracing, uh, we talk about communications um, and transparency. Uh, I believe transparency and communication has a second part, which is accountability. Um, West Data does a, an amazing job of being accountable for the positive cases and the contact tracing that comes out of it. That communication is being done, and I'll talk about some of it and specifics of it. Um, through personal communications, we have nurses, principals, those directors, supervisors making phone calls. They're meeting with people in person. They're sending emails. As well, they're doing group communications and they're meeting groups in person. They're making phone calls and they're sending emails. These are the, to those that need to know. Um, and I feel that there's a large amount of accountability when you meet with individuals directly and talk about um, their possible exposure or close contact, what they need to do and how they can take care of themselves. Contact tracing. Um, um, identify the close contacts. We asked them to quarantine. We've communicated um, to the community, and now what? So now we are faced with operational decisions. So back in June, we had came up with the plan of when we make an operational decision, and I know a lot of you, um, we've had um, conversations about a number, and we've really struggled with what's the right number? How do we come up with that number? What's that metric? 
And we've always said that it's um, probably a group of variables that we need to look at and consider when we make these big decisions of whether we're going to quarantine a group, whether we're going to cancel an activity, whether we're going to quarantine an entire classroom or an entire grade. Are we going to cancel a program, a special ed program, or do we close an entire school or the district? So remember, operational decisions aren't just a number. This is a complex process. And thank you again, Dr. Pape, for bringing um, that to light. Um, we started recently considering those multiple considerations that we defined back in June and how to quantify them and assign metrics to make it easier for the board um, to see some of the decision-making process as well as for our staff to see um, and bring to light the seriousness um, of these decisions and the number of variables that it takes to make these decisions. And so we call this fondly the seven points of light and it's to provide us guidance and recognize that every case has its own unique situation. So the seven points of light, the seven operational goals that were in the plan, say that one will consider what Ada County community level of transmission is. Number two, we'll look at West Ada's community level of transmission by high school, middle school, and elementary. It took six weeks to collect data. We couldn't do this from day one because we had no data. But we did have the metrics, and we did have this identified as an area that once we got the data, we could utilize this in decision making. Number three, the number of cases within a 14-day period. How many? Were they distinct? Was there a cluster? Was there a merge? And we can talk about some of these definitions. Um, Dr. Pate and I, we slightly have a different interpretation with cluster, and just to point that out, a cluster we're defining as a group of um, positive individuals that belong to the same group within a finite period of time without community transmission. And what Dr. Pate refers to a cluster, it's with community transmission. And it's, so it's important that we know that because some of the communications were previously sent to our um, staff and parents have referred to cluster. And it wasn't meant to um, um, suggest that there was community transmission. All it was doing was identifying a number of cases that were positive within a finite group within a uh, set time frame. And then um, have the clusters within the school merge to become indistinct, and that's what Dr. Pate refers to as an outbreak. Um, number four, what's the, what's the positive case or cases impact on the overall student body? How many students are in isolation as a result of it and or as a result of COVID-related processes, the symptoms, the testing, the exposures, and the positive cases? What's our overall absentee rate with a 10% threshold? What's the overall staff impact? What's the staff absent rates within that building? What's the availability of subs for those staff? And can those staff teach remote and teach effectively? Uh, number six, what is the state of our local health care system? We had always said we're part of a community and we would look at our local health care systems and we're basing this off the percent of overall bed capacity with COVID-related diagnoses. St. Luke's and St. Al's back in June and July did a great job of providing data for the community and we've categorized that data here. Um, with the understandings of zero to seven percent of their bed capacity um, is doing well. Seven to 14, they're starting to get nervous. They're in the moderate risk and over 14, uh, they have some concerns. And they'll let me know if, if this was misinterpreted or misconstrued and we'll make sure that we have this point of it accurate, but this was the information we had. And then lastly, we'll look at extent of exposure risks. So we look at, was the exposure at the school minimal? Were there no close contacts identified? Did the positive case self-isolate and can return once they've discontinued home isolation and the quarantine criteria has been met? The second is, was the exposure to others in the school moderate? Were there a handful of close contacts identified? Um, and again, did they stay home and isolate? 
And then the last is, was the exposure risk severe? Were there multiple close contacts identified? And was there a risk to the larger school community that warranted a dismissal? All of that we put together and we take a look at it um, as to making operational decisions. Do we close down programs, classes, schools? Um, and so the next thing is um, talking about our dashboard and um, publishing information, making sure that we're protecting the confidentiality of our students and staff. Um, and we've set up systems and processes that we believe is doing that. Um, we have a public dashboard that identifies four of those um, seven points of light. Um, since there's not just a number and we want our, our parents um, and our students and our staff that look at that information to be able to look at it um, with those seven points of light in, in place. So currently the public dashboard talks about 80 counties community level of transmission. Currently it's 27.14. West Ada's level of transmission by high school, middle and elementary. You'll see that after collecting six weeks of data, the data is supportive of um, the preliminary assumptions that little spread in the elementary it gets higher at middle school and then at your high school levels you're seeing um, higher levels. You will see that uh, West Ada's um, cases per 100,000 are less than Ada counties and we would expect that and hope that we would see that because we have mitigating measures in place. The community doesn't have those mitigating measures. Um, CDH has identified that a huge problem in our community is the quote unquote backyard barbecues and the social activities. Um, and so we would expect that West Ada would be functioning at a higher level or a lower level of cases per 100,000. And the data now is supporting that. Um, we can look at cases by building and see if we have areas or gaps. And we can look at the number of students in isolation. That's all available as of tonight on the public dashboard. Um, and then for the leadership team to make operational decisions, we have a uh, leadership dashboard. And it contains um, the criteria for the seven points of light. And at this point, I believe that we have five of those up and operational. So operational decisions, I'll give you a few examples of how this works. We had an elementary school and we got four positive cases in one day. So that could be a cluster. So we started going through the process. We did the contact surveillance. I know the answer to this because we, it was apparent pretty quick and easy. But to let you know how looking at numbers can be mis misleading. So you got four positive cases and everybody's like, oh my gosh, what went on there? Well, at that time, we knew that Ada County was in yellow. West Ada's community um, cases per 100,000 uh, was low. The number of cases in a 14-day uh, period, we had the four positive cases in one day. That's huge. Um, but the cases were distinct. Uh, the overall student body impact, it didn't impact the absentee rate. And we only had those four students quarantining. The impact on our staff was zero. We didn't have to isolate any staff. The state of our local health care resources was zero to seven percent, and the extent of the exposure risk was minimal with no close contacts identified. The problem with looking at a number and the positive cases was that in this case, they were siblings and they had never attended in-person school. They had been in quarantine since day one. So when we look just at numbers, it's misleading. Operational decision number two example was middle school. We had a middle school case. Um, we knew from working with CDH and from our own experience that we were starting to see a number of cases um, um, appear in our volleyball programs. Um, and so at one of our middle schools, we had a situation in which uh, we had a staff member have symptoms, a student have si multiple students symptom, uh, they're out, they're quarantining, we get a positive case, we get another positive case, 
and pretty soon we have six positive cases in a five-day period. So let's go through the operational decision tree. Ada County at that time was yellow. West Ada, um, it should say middle school, community level of um, transmission, um, cases per 100,000 was moderate. The number of cases in the 14-day period was six cases over five days. We identified two clusters. Remember, cluster, when we used the definition, was not community spread. So we received three cases in one particular athletic program and two cases in another athletic program. Technically, those two, case, uh, those two clusters merged. The reason why is you had an uh, individual in one of the activities dating an individual in the other activity, and they were both positive. The overall body, uh, student um, body impact, we initially quarantined 63 students in less than 48 hours. Um, eventually, we got that down to 25 that served their eventual quarantine period. The staff impact, we had three staff quarantine across two schools. The state and local health care resources was at that zero to seven percent. The extent of the exposure risk was we had some multiple close contacts, 63, and we identified the risk of exposure to the larger school community. But the key here was that due to the quick mobilization and quarantine, we watched for conversion of the exposures to positive cases, watched and monitored under the guidance of CDH, and we had none. So the staff mobilized and moved quickly, and it prevented spread within the building. Operational decisions at the high school level. Um, and each one of these just gets more complex, um, as you can see. Um, but it's just to let you know some of the decision-making process um, and how the staff are working together as a team to make, dis make good, sound decisions. So in this case, um, we had, again, volleyball. So remember, we're seeing volleyball come up in a couple of cases. It wasn't the, the activity of volleyball, and I want to make sure that's clear. Um, Centric District Health was looking at it statewide. West Ada was looking at it statewide. What's going on in volleyball? Why are we seeing multiple cases happening in volleyball when in fall sports we anticipated it might be football? or it might be soccer. And so we were looking at volleyball with, why are we getting multiple cases at two or three or four schools? What's going on? We very quickly at those schools, just so you know, we're quarantining and isolating those teams. Um, so we were, we were preventing the spread. But we were looking at what's unique about volleyball that um, we're seeing more cases than in other sports. Um, it ended up there were multiple factors, as there always is. One is that there was a community event involving volleyball that happened about five days before the cases started um, um, presenting themselves in West Data. So that could have been a likely place. There were multiple players from multiple schools, from middle school and high school in attendance. Um, the other thing that was interesting that we looked at was the socialization of the volleyball teams themselves. Um, volleyball players tend to be a tighter knit group than most other sports or activities. And so we were finding a lot of sleepovers, a lot of ride sharing to and from activities, um, as well as um, if a practice was canceled or an event was canceled due to a positive case, they were still meeting outside of school and having social activities. Um, so we learned from that, and then we're able to provide education to the, those parents and students um, and coaches as to um, how we're in this as a community. But I just want to point that out that with volleyball, um, you hear it's volleyball, and it actually wasn't the activity of volleyball or the sport of volleyball it tended to lean more towards the socialization of the individuals participating and the outside activities. So at high school, uh, one of our high schools, we got two or three cases. We had been watching this and seeing this happen. Within 24, 48 hours, we quarantined all four teams as a precautionary measure um, without waiting to see if we got other cases. Um, within a five-day period, there was eight cases, but remember that they were quarantined. 
We had already removed them from the school environment to prevent the spread. Uh, Ada County had just moved to red that same day. West Ada's um, cases per 100,000 was moderate. We had three cases, as I identified, in two days, and we quarantined four teams, 48 uh, students, and five staff. Five additional positive cases came over five days with no additional exposure risk to the community. We had four probable cases identified by CDH at the same time. Those individuals had already been quarantined because there was a household member that was positive. So again, there was no further exposure risk to that school. So now you have 12 cases that have been quarantined with no exposure to the school community. Um, with that, there were 4,000 communications that were made, at least 4,000 that we counted to include what was going on, status updates, and what was happening, as well as what we were seeing um, with students and extracurricular activities. Uh, please don't ride share right now. Um, please make sure your students are wearing their masks. Please limit social activities on weekends and after school. Um, the overall impact to the student body, we had 60 students in quarantine, 28 served their entire quarantine. The staff impact, we had four staff in quarantine. All of them were non-teaching staff. Um, so there was no impact on the educational environment. Um, we canceled the um, program in that case because we had no, all, of, all the coaches were ended up in quarantine. So we couldn't run that program. The state and local health care resources were at 10 to 14 percent, and the extent of the exposure risk was multi, uh, moderate. So at this case, we pulled together a team and said, within 24, 48 hours of getting this information, contacted CDH and said, do we need to close down a school? This is what's going on. This information was presented to CDH. It was presented to leadership. And the decision was made as a group that since the exposure to the school was minimal and the risk of exposure to the larger school community had been contained and was moderate, that we would not close down the school and we would continue to monitor and watch. Those cases have continued to go down over the last two weeks. So performance improvement activities. So when the contact tracing ends, the performance improvement activities begin. Uh, we've been having mandatory staff education. We've had an audit of staff understanding of the previously provided education that's scheduled to come out. We have student and staff education. We have newsletters that go out. We have communications regarding the positive cases, what we're seeing and what we need to do. We have multiple behind the scene meetings. How can we do better? What do we need to do differently? We have audits of our schools that will be forthcoming. And all of this is ongoing. It never ends and it never will. So I'll take any questions at this time. Um, is that everything that administration was going to? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, trustees, and Superintendent Dr. Reynolds, good evening. I believe there are some questions going to be up there. Do I need to flip it? Or Troy needs to flip it for me? There we go. Thank you. So um, going back to the audit, the first layer of our audit um, for us uh, will be to uh, survey our staff this week. And these questions uh, went out to our principals this week. And along with their leadership team, they will be you know, surveying all staff and then uh, reviewing, reviewing the results. And I'd like to mention that um, when we started the high reliability schools process uh, a little over two years ago, the first level was, you know, ensuring that we have a safe and collaborative school. And you never leave it. I mean, even though you, you um, can demonstrate that you are safe and collaborative, it's, it's, all, it's always ongoing. You go back and you review. Well, this pandemic 
has certainly proven to us that uh, we are stretched. And once again, we need to ensure that we have a safe school. So uh, this survey will help leaders identify the trouble spots. And we knew in August when we created our health and safety plans that uh, these would just be a living, ongoing document. By no means did we know that the uh, document that we posted online, I believe September 13th, would be the final, uh, the final uh, version because things are always changing. So as we know, we have to go back into the classrooms and look for areas that are still causing issues for us. And, then, and if you follow the, the, some of the language we use with the high reliability schools process, you'll hear the term FOD walk, and that's foreign object debris. And, and in a, a aircraft carrier language, that's when all hands are on deck, they're sweeping uh, the deck of the ship before the, uh, uh, the jets take off. One little piece of garbage, anything tiny can mess up an airplane. And so uh, the schools are essentially our flight decks. And so the, all of the staff will be going through and looking for those areas that we, need, that we need to improve. And you can look there from the questions. You know, we're going to get a lot of feedback. And it could be um, as simple as I already looked at some of the uh, survey results from one of my schools, um, came down to the mass being the issue, but it's, it's not that the students or staff aren't wearing them, it's just they feel like they're not wearing them properly. So, you know, is it not covering your nose? Or is it, you know, up over your, over your face or where it's not supposed to be? So, well, what's the goal then? What, what goals will you set to improve that area? It might just be as simple as having daily lessons in the classroom to demonstrate, okay, folks, show me how your mask is on, this is how we wear it. It might be out in the uh, social areas where uh, kids maybe are forgetting about putting them on properly. It might be that the high school level staff have to rally together and say, okay, we probably need more uh, people out in the social areas during passing periods just to remind students. Those are just examples of strategies that I, that I foresee. We foresee the schools uh, putting together to address some of these concerns. So again, uh, this is only uh, you know, the first layer of the audit, and we, we certainly look forward uh, to learning from the medical professionals uh, that Dr. Pate mentioned in his recommendations as being the next layer of our audits. And just to use a quote that Dr. Pate used at the beginning, um, you know, this is our opportunity to get better. And we, we embrace it. We look forward to it. Any questions? Uh, th <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Stans and Mrs. Garner and Mr. Heller. And I got a thumbs up from Mr. Heller, which must mean that we're that was everything administration had to present. So uh, after that, are there any questions from trustees? Trustee Azuna. I'll start with a question, a comment from Ms. Gardner. And while you're working your way up here, I'll start with my comment. Um, I had some time to look at that dashboard today, and I just can't thank you enough for making sure that we got that information out there, including the number of kids that we have in quarantine or isolation or you know, identified as part of that. I think that that will really help our staff, our parents, the community overall be comfortable with where we're at. Um, from where it was when we saw it the first time to where it was when I looked at it today. I mean, there's a lot of additional information out there and just, I, I do really appreciate you and the rest of the team um, for pulling all that together. My question is, um, when you talk about the quarantine period, it's a really long length of time. And I have heard, and, and I'm sure you're hearing from a lot of parents that are quite concerned with, my child has a sniffle and now they're home for 10 days unless I go and test or we had this exposure and now we're looking at 28 days. And what are you seeing out there related to families that might be hiding symptoms or trying to bring their kids back in? Or do we have any risk out there with some of those pieces? And what are we doing to balance that? So um, first I'll say thank you for acknowledging the data. That's uh, great work. Our data analytics team and the staff that work together pulling that information are amazing. So thank you for acknowledging that. Um, 
Do individuals hide symptoms? Uh, yes, I believe it's rare. I believe the majority of people in our community understand and appreciate the risk. Um, with regards to symptoms, uh, it is very challenging for parents to have um, students, especially now in red, to quarantine for 14 days for sniffles when um, they may have seasonal allergies right now. We do know that you can have seasonal allergies and you can have COVID. And so it's difficult to ascertain the difference between those. I would say that um, with symptoms, that might be a time to test. While you wait for the test results, you're still in quarantine. And so, um, like I, I mentioned earlier, I really welcome um, Dr. Pate's input in the medical community on how we can use the data that we've collected thus far in looking at those quarantines with regards specifically to symptoms and seeing if we can shorten that time interval. Great, but one follow up to that, and I don't know what this looks like. I'm fortunate to have great insurance, but for families that don't, if, if you have a child that has a symptom and so they're out for 10 days or 14 days or whatever that looks like, unless they test in that scenario, are those tests being provided free of charge for kids to get back into school? Do you, does anybody know that? No? I, I was just I'm curious. I'm sure I could, I could find out for you. Okay. Trustee Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I have a couple different questions and I don't know exactly, so I'm just hoping whoever is the right person will take them. Um, the, so this is all around the recommendation. So um, the first question I have is in the recommendation, who's the actual decision maker of a closing of a school or of a switch to a different model for the school? Is it the superintendent? Is it the COVID task force? Is it the board? What's the proposal? Trustees, uh, Chairman, I, I, that's a great question actually. And I think that's something, um, I, I believe what we would, we would recommend is that we, we have a, a, a smaller vert part of our COVID task force that, that kind of would look at as situations are coming up, looking at our dashboard, looking at the information, this already kind of happens informally when we look at, as, as Ms. Garner talked about, if we have a problem at a certain program, we bring a group of people together that might include, might include the activities director if it's an athletic situation, often it's Ramona Lee if, because it's a special education situation. So we're bringing a group of people together to look at all the relevant facts and make a decision on a program. And that's a different thing particularly than maybe shutting an entire school down and so I guess part of that would be um, something that the board needs to probably reconcile and make some level of decision on in terms of who they would give that authority to because I don't know that the board wants us to have to convene special meetings every time we have to make one of those decisions because we would like to be able to make those decisions quickly enough um, to shut that school down and get that quarantine period um, started as quickly as possible for the um, for the families in those in those schools. Thanks. Yeah, so some clarity on what the recommendation is would, would be helpful because that's a helpful consideration point in the accepting the recommendation. The other um, questions I have, um, so I will tell you my concern with the recommendation that administration is making is the complexity of it for families. So we potentially have a family with kids on three different schedules in the same week. Um, and I can see, you know, removing some complexity in that in just the four and five. Uh, but I want to understand two things around the recommendation and why, right? So the first question I have around it is we talked about the classroom size, but what we know today is that our enrollment data is down. And so what I wanted to know is have we looked at the data in a more aggregate way and said this is what our average classroom size is for four and five across the district versus one, two, and three. That's one question. And the other is if we have a classroom in one, two, and three that's over 25 or 26, do we create a new classroom or do we just overload those classrooms? So Chairman and Trustees, I, I can try to answer that. And I don't know if, if Dave Roberts wants to talk at all about the average class size. I know he did look recently at K3 versus four or five and we were seeing 
that we do have many classes in the fourth and fifth grade area that are at or above that 32 threshold. And so, um, like anything in a system, there's variability. There's also fourth and fifth grade classes that are below that 32 threshold, and there is that variability. Um, whether we automatically add another class um, every time somebody hits that above that 25 or 26 number um, often depends on one thing, which would be do we even have a classroom for that extra grade level class to be taught into? So do we have a classroom that we could move a group of students into? Um, you know, when is that in the year? Does, can, can we find a way to budget that? So I think it, the answer that you all probably don't love hearing very much is it depends uh, on, on, on what's going on in that particular situation. Um, yeah, and I, I agree with you in terms of, I, I know that Trustee Ozuna sat in and was, has been able to listen in on the, on the meetings as a COVID task force, and we wrestled quite a bit with this idea of, are we gonna really have three different levels of, especially what happens on a Monday, right? You now have K through three attending every single day of the week uh, with, a, with an early release on Monday. You have fourth and fifth attending on an alternating day to, you know, Monday through Friday. Um, but alternating which group comes on Monday, which adds that other layer of complexity, and then you have your 612 doing um, the alternating day with no, um, with, with remote learning completely on Monday. And so, honestly, I think there's a few different options you can look at if you want to remove some of the complexity. Um, you can do what, what was kind of discussed earlier, which is K5 attends every day and has an early release on Monday. So now you have a K5 plan and you have a 612 plan. Um, I'll say that our COVID task force and those elementary principals that are on the COVID task force felt very strongly that fourth and fifth grade was their biggest challenge and they weren't speaking just for their four schools but from talking to all their colleagues that fourth and fifth grade was the area where they were the most challenged to meet the physical distancing expectations um, with any level of consistency and so they felt very strongly with this recommendation. Um, the other option I suppose uh, is um, to give the fourth and fifth grade students a remote learning day on Monday so they're more in line with our alternating day students at the 6 through 12. Um, I don't know there's a great appetite for removing um, another in-person day from our elementary students schedule. And then of course I, the other option I guess would be K-12 to have that remote learning Monday so now your entire system is remote on Monday and then Tuesday through Friday is your alternating day schedule for your fourth grade and above. So there are 30, you know, for fourth and above. So those are various options you could consider. Our proposal came from what the COVID task force um, and those principals believed was the best situation for where we are now. Now I will say, we're not saying that we're not gonna keep working on fourth and fifth grade. I think our goal is where can we find solutions in fourth and fifth grade to ensure that we can do that adequate physical distancing. Once we can find those solutions, we'll be more than happy to come forward to this board and say we'd like to get fourth and fifth back in school every day. And that would be a priority for us to try to find solutions for that. So Mr. Chair, I think I just probably don't wanna belabor Mr. Heller. I think what I understand is, is most of the recommendations is based right now on experience or um, kind of conversations between folks. And so maybe I'll just express my concerns I think we're gonna, Dr. Pate talked about the future steps that we're gonna go through. And the first one on that list was surveying the data. And what I'm concerned about is we have complexity, uh, adding a layer of complexity to our families. And then we could find in that data that we didn't need to add that layer of complexity to our families. We could find that we shift it differently. The other piece of data and information that I'm not, I haven't been able to see yet is what is our assessment of how effective our remote learning has been after six weeks sure. um, and where our students are at after they've all gone through their educational assessments. So I guess what I'm probably most concerned about is continuing to follow the pattern we've been following, which is changing this schedule for people multiple times before we really have a solid proposal. So I, I don't know how to remove that concern, but that's where I'm sitting today with kind of, you know, where, and I'm not faulting anybody by any means. <laughs> um, just knowing we're just kind of starting to get the medical help in, we're gonna have to look at the data more. I, I, I do wanna say, I also looked at the COVID dashboard, but there's also some additional dashboards there that I thought were really good around our school sizes and our classroom um, loads. So how many fourth graders, fifth graders, third graders were in each school. Um, and I saw schools with, you know, when I just looked at it as I was going through it, some schools have high fourth and fifth grade, some schools have high first and second grade. And so you, you can't tell just by looking at the dashboard, we really need that analysis of the data to understand 
um, what's going on in those classrooms. So I guess I have concerns right now, just based on, I don't want to keep changing things on people until we have a really good plan. Any other trustee questions or comments? Trustee Azuna. I'm going to start maybe with an easy question and then Great. do some brainstorming with you out loud. Okay. <laughs> if you'll bear with me Sounds through good. that. So the plan is to put K through three back in school every day with an early release Monday. Um, first, I really appreciate the extra prep time that's going to get to our teachers because I think that they desperately need that and deserve that. And we're asking a lot from them. So thank you. Um, Knowing that the recommendation is to put K through three back every day, is there any reason why we couldn't start that as soon as parents want to make that happen? Do we need to wait? Is there any reason why we need to wait to November 10th? Sure. Can they support both, both kids, I mean, kids in both scenarios temporarily? So chairman trustees, I will say that a couple pieces. Um, one of the things that we, we've heard is, and our COVID task force talked a lot about is when we make a change, so there is a need for maybe some time for parents to making the adjustments with how the schedule is going to affect them. Um, secondary to that, and, and but also maybe also a very primary issue is it's going to change our transportation plan a little bit. And I would, um, um, if we're to think about this from the perspective of if we were to say Monday of this coming week, K through three is going to start going back to school daily with this Monday early release in place. That is going to present a challenge because you're releasing those kids earlier and a lot of those same buses also have to go and pick up a middle school or a high school route. And so you're now gonna compress your time in between those routes. Because our currently, I mean our six through 12 would be attending on Monday unless we move, the, unless you decided you wanted to approve this whole plan to start earlier than the 10th. Let me rephrase. So our K through three prior to here recently, they were all day every day. Correct. Could we just go back, the early release Monday, I understand sure. the need for that to be November 10th, time for transportation, et cetera. But if a family wanted to have their kids go back all K through three, all day, every day, starting tomorrow, w would teachers be ready for that? I mean, is there any reason why that couldn't happen earlier? I would hate to speak for every teacher, but I would say I wouldn't, I don't know that I would feel comfortable saying flip the switch tomorrow. Um, but if we wanted to move it up to maybe even the following week, that's something we can certainly, I mean, that's something that the board certainly could, could choose to do is to accelerate that okay. and get the, get the K3 back to school daily sooner than the 10th. I, I, yeah, I understand the need for transition time for some families, but I also understand the need that having them in sooner would be really beneficial for others. So I just wondered if we could support both, and it sounds like um, we'd need to make a decision and do all at one time. So um, that's okay. So the brainstorming that I wanted to do with you maybe is around four and five and if these classroom audits are going to take place this week and we really probably need to understand what that looks like in the four and five classroom do we have time to l get the results of that and use that as a decision maker for what we do for four and five can I ask a clarifying question yes. are you asking are we gonna have the time before the 10th to make that decision is that your question um, I think our directors are going to gather the information from their buildings uh, in the short term uh, and try to put all that together and try to identify where are the areas of gaps, again, from what we're hearing from our buildings. If you look even back to our survey results of teachers, fourth and fifth was kind of where this dividing line started to show up in terms of some struggle with the comfort level with in-person learning mm -hmm. um, um, every day. So. I think that we'll, we'll start to have a better idea of where our problems are. Trying to figure out creative ways to solve those problems may take longer than the next week and a half, two weeks will, will be. And that's really what came out of our principals on the COVID task force was in the short term, the next couple of weeks prior to November 10th, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I think back to Trustee Johnson's point, however, is you know we move to fourth and fifth going alternating day and then maybe not too long after we say, you know what, we're actually in a better shape than we thought and we, fi we fixed some of the issues and we feel like we now can go every day, that's then potentially another transition for a group of families. And that's where I think the, the struggle sits a little bit. Do you make the change that four and five should mirror K through three and then we take a risk that we can't, it doesn't look safe for us to do that and we switch back or 
we let four and five look different, find out we can put them in, and we do yet another change for our family. And either one of those scenarios are, are great. <laughs> yeah, we, we're not always blessed with um, a, a really clear option of which one's the best one often. And that's, that's the challenge for you and often for us is we're, um, you know, the, what's the best of the two not so comfortable options for us? I, I will say, and I think as Dr. Pate talked about, is we'll know, we'll know very quickly if we bring all of them back, whether we start to see clusters and outbreaks within our fourth and fifth grade classrooms. We will start to find out some of that information. I, I do worry um, about going too far away from the, the things, the expertise of the folks that are working in those elementary buildings. I am not an elementary person, and those fourth and fifth grade teachers and those, el those elementary principals um, were very, very convincing to us that they felt like this was the best next step, but I do understand the, 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 con the problem that it presents to the board because it may present another transition at a later date. One follow-up question. Um, with the large volume of students that we have at the virtual schoolhouse, how do most of our schools today have an extra classroom? Oh, I don't know that I could answer that. Um, okay. Mr. Roberts, do you have an idea of that? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. No, don't I told you. Like. This was my brainstorming out loud. It <laughs> Chairman Newhoff, Trustee Ozuna, Dr. Rannells. Um, <laughs> I think right now we do have some schools that have extra rooms. I, I would not say most at all. Um, now, with that said, could there be rooms? What ends up happening in the school, and I think we've talked about this before, is that rooms get used up for other reasons. And so, no, we don't have a bunch of empty space. Um, and we have, the way, the way we've done virtual schoolhouse, is we have satellite teachers that are teaching in the, in the rooms without students. So there could be possibility that we would have rooms available if we move those satellite teachers to teach from home or, or something like that. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, that's not a very good answer. Yep, I, no, that's a great answer. I did want to follow up on another question. If, if you want to know on, on class sizes, specifically by grade and, and things like that, um, when, when we were looking at this, and this, these are numbers when we're going every other day, so they'd be doubled on, on average if we were going every day in grade school. But in, in elementary as a whole, you know, we have a total of about 1,500 and 38 classrooms, 1,183 of those have 12 or less, 148, 13 or less, or 13, 100 at 14, 62 at 15, um, 23 at 16, 12 at 17, and then we have 10 total that are at 18, 19, and 20. When we get into our middle school and high school, Trustee Johnson, in, in middle school, um, on the same thing, we have a total of 5,296 classes. And remember, in middle school, we're now going by periods, which was what Dr. Pate talked about. It complicates the issue on potting and things. But out of those 5,296 classes, we have 3,493 that are at 12 at less, um, 489 at 13, 434 at 14, 388 at 15, and then it goes very small up to classes about 29 in size and that's with a half class so those classes are going to be PE or music classes mostly and then in our high school we have a total of 3,220 classes and we have 1,241 of those with 12 or less um, 270 at 13, 335 at 14, 322 at 15, 310 at 16 and so when you're getting on those numbers you're getting 30, 32, 34 kids in a classroom if they went every single day um, and then just quick and dirty, um, I did a, and this isn't a very good way, but in, but in, just to give you a sense, an average is a dangerous number to use for this decision. And, we, and we, what we've done is class by class, and that's what the audit is going to do, is look at how many kids are in each classroom specifically. But just so you know, as an order of magnitude, um, in kindergarten, we average about 18.8 .8 students per classroom. First grade about 20, second grade at 19.85, uh, third grade at 20.67, and then you'll see in fourth and fifth it jumps up to 24 and 24 on an, a on an average basis. Um, specifically for third grade, 
we did that analysis. We basically have out of our 113 third grade classrooms in brick and mortar, we have 17 classrooms that are 18 or less students. We have 80 classrooms that are between 23 and 19. And then we have 18 classes that are between 24 and 28, just to know a range. I've not done that for fourth and fifth, but that's fourth and fifth. Well, those numbers will jump up because we're more in the 30 range, you know, overall with some small outliers. Mr. Roberts, can you tell me in a classroom with 28 desks and using all of the space, do you get, is it possible to get social distancing? I mean, what is the, what is the number there without the, the small pods, the number of kids that you can distance before you have to start using this small pod concept? Well, Chairman Newhoff, Trustee Ozuna, I, I think again, me being a math guy, I can tell you that if we have a 950 square foot room and each student needs 36 square feet to have their bubble, it's 28 kids. So, but our rooms aren't square boxes without anything in them. So, you know, I, I, I don't know, and a classroom teacher would be better to answer that question than me, but I, you know, I, I think when you get into the above 25, it's, it's very, very difficult. And in some rooms, even at 24 and 25 could be very difficult in those situations. Any trustees have anything else? Mr. Heller, did you have something you were going to? Okay. Thank you. All right, it's 820. Is everyone doing okay? Does anyone need a break? A break? All right, so we're going to break um, for 10 minutes and reconvene at 830.
Mr. Stevens, are you all right? Okay, the board is back in session. Um, a number of people have signed up to testify. Um, and in a few cases, there may be some ambiguity about which item, whether it's this one or the next one, although I suspect they're all about this one. If I call your name and it's about the next one, just kindly let me know. Um, most of the people had really good handwriting tonight, so I'm going to do my best to, to get everyone's names right. And I, I want you all to realize that the board has received a lot of input on sort of all aspects of this, okay? Both in email and in testimony and previously. And we don't consider what goes on here to be sort of a vote in terms of <laughs> 10 people voted in favor of this or spoke in favor of this thing. So given a, the hour, if, you know, if it seems appropriate um, and somebody's already kind of made the point you've made, you might want to think about deferring your time. Uh, the first name I will call is Erica Haircamp. And if I mispronounce your name, please let me know. Is she here? Okay, thank you. Uh, David Phillips. Okay. I would like to speak for the next item. Oh, for the next item. Okay, thank you. And oh, the other thing I forgot to mention. Um, you'll have three minutes. There'll be a timer. Mr. Uh, Stevens has put up here. And uh, when you get up, please um, state your name and your address. Um, so the next name I have is Angie Elkington. You want our address? Huh? You want our address? Y yeah. Oh, I'm... Okay. Angie Elkington. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Reynolds. I come before you today because I feel like I have no other choice. In doing so, I put myself at risk personally and professionally. My message is simple. It's time to stop messing around and do what is right. Before the school year began, parents and teachers analyzed our detailed color-coded plan to determine what was best for them and their families. The plan clearly explained that the level to which schools would operate would be based on the level of community spread. By not adhering to this plan and by being indecisive, you created chaos in an environment in which everyone feels justified in making demands as to what it will look like in our classrooms across the district. In my 27 years of teaching, I have never felt more confused or vulnerable. We have a problem. Who are you going to go to to get the help that you need to fix our current situation? I venture to assume that when you have a problem, you go to those with training and experience for help. So I ask, why are you not going to your professionals now? Who is more prepared to help improve education and learning for our students than the professionals you have hired? You have highly qualified, passionate teachers who love our students, our schools, and our community. Despite what many parent groups are saying, we are not pansies. We are concerned educators. We are concerned for our students, our classrooms, and our own families. We are not feigning concern because we don't want to do our jobs. We want to work in our pajamas, or we don't want to have to work to earn a paycheck. Yes, I have read all the vile and nasty comments that are on social media about teachers, and they cut me to the core. Unfortunately, none of us have been exempt. For the past few months, our district has faced vicious attacks. At first, the target was placed on the board's back. Then it was transferred to the district administration. Since a concerned group of teachers decided to take extreme measures in a desperate attempt to get you to listen to their concerns, the target then shifted to their backs. When you were all under attack, I will tell you, many of us stood behind you. Have you given us that same confidence? Have you stood behind us? Right now, it sure doesn't feel like it, and for me, it feels personal. Members of the board and Dr. Reynolds, I know your commitment to our schools. Dr. Reynolds, I feel like I know your heart, and I know when you took over, it was your leadership that helped us heal when morale was at an all-time low. Mr. Heller, I don't know you personally, but I have only heard good things about you, and I have no doubt that you are a strong leader. Jeff, Mandy, and Dave, I do know you personally, and I have nothing but respect for you and the leadership you have shown over your years. years. So I ask you, as the leaders that you are, all of you, why are you not listening to your staff 
and why are you allowing us to be thrown to the wolves? If you choose not to listen to the educators who are in the classroom, many of whom are telling you it is unsafe in our current situation, you will lose us. If you lose us, you will lose those who are in a prime position to make things right for our students. By listening to and supporting your teachers, you support our students. We are not here asking you to do anything but allow us to do what we do best in a safe environment. We are committed to doing what's best for the students we love. Do not doubt that. Do not doubt us. And please listen. Thank you. Okay, then, uh, Mr. Phillips. Do you know that the main problem with your online platform, you use Teams when everybody else uses Google? What is your job? Are you in medical care? Or are you in education? Staff won't follow the rules. Bashing kids on social media, they're calling our kids booger pickers and immune freaks. Th that, those are the teachers that we want our, uh, teaching our kids. Calling in sick when they are not sick. Allowing kids to fail. I actually have proof of this. A special education teacher just had a series of general ed teachers refuse to go to a meeting to address a kid who's failing three classes. Um, texting out student photos. Until Dr. Pate and Dr. Rannells put a stop to this, these teachers thought it was appropriate to take pictures of our students, our kids, and send them out to someone who, did not, who was not affiliated with the school district, even though he's helping us. Um, sharing out parent personal information. The union was seeking out parents who might be uh, kind to their cause. So they started taking our personal information and giving it to Eric Thies so that he could try to strong arm us into bending to the teacher's red shirt will. That is inappropriate. You guys have to do something as leadership, as leadership, as leadership. Consequences, actions have consequences. My middle schooler has had 13 days of instruction and the quarter's almost over. Online learning is not instruction. It is giving out assignments. So you cannot count those days as instruction. There is no instruction going on. Why does Eric Thies have a seat on the executive uh, committee? Yet there are no parents. Nobody speaks for the kids or the parents. We have identified 200 teachers, names and sites who have called off on Monday with Eric Thies' assist assistance. Thank you, Eric. Dr. Pate meets with teachers, but not parents. Parents don't matter. I just addressed this with Dr. Pate and pleaded that parents be included in this, not just listening to what you guys have already decided, but to ask us what we think. Stop saying that we're, we're faking our kids' illnesses. I just had a daughter who has suffered a concussion at Meridian Middle School and because of your inept school nurse and because of your guys' quick jump for everything is COVID, I could have had a dead child because I didn't find out until dinner that night that she had been taking a volleyball to the face. Your guys' lack of leadership and concern for the parents is getting ridiculous. I am sick and tired of it and something needs to be done. Stop bending to their will, punish them when they do what they're not supposed to and start caring about the parents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, Candace Johnson. Good evening, uh, Chair, Board, Dr. Reynolds. I am a parent. I am a parent of two children in the West Ada School District. And I have some big, pretty big concerns about sending our children to school while we, while we have such a high community spread. I have two children in West Ada School District. They are both in middle and high school. I've had to call both schools about mask compliance, one of them twice. I'm concerned with the health of all the students and the teachers. I understand it's not easy to do remote learning. I understand that some kids struggle more than others. 
However, I do believe it's up to us as parents to help our children and provide that extra guidance. It's not the sole responsibility of the teacher to teach our children. As parents, we must do our part. I'm concerned that the school has had since March to figure this out and nothing's been done. We should not be resorting to packing our kids in schools, risking the health and lives of each one of them, their families, the teachers, and their families. I'm concerned about our community. I'm concerned that West Ada School District is hiring more substitutes for when the teachers are out sick. I'm concerned the teachers are not going to be able to teach effectively because they're overridden with fear and exhaustion and because they have to juggle two different lesson plans each day. I worry about our teachers. We do not give them half the credit they deserve. Our teachers before the pandemic were already overburdened and underpaid. The governor continues to take more money from education, but also demands we stay in classes. The teachers were presented a contract in the beginning. They signed, but yet the promise is not kept. Parents are ridiculing and harassing teachers. In some cases, even the kids are doing it in class. I've heard this myself while my son's in a class um, on his hybrid day. This is not how we should treat someone that's be being considered an essential worker. This brings me to essential worker. Maslow's hierarchical of needs has three sections. Basic, psychological, or basic, basic level, psychological needs such as food, water, warmth, and rest. Basic needs also include security and safety. Based on this, I see that we're stripping teachers of their right to safety and security so that we can appease the political agenda. Education is so very important, but it does not have to happen inside a classroom, and it is not the sole responsibility of a teacher to provide. As it is when students are out because they have an allergy or cold symptoms, they're aligning with COVID symptoms. They're missing instruction. My son was out with the sniffles, missing instruction, because instruction doesn't happen on hybrid days because this teacher cannot be in two places at once. Please do the right thing. Follow the plan that we all were told was going to happen. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, the next name I have is Jen Halliday. Hi, my name is Jen Halliday. I, my address, I live in CUNA, I'm in West Ada. My kids attend Mountain View High School. Uh, Superintendent Reynolds, Chairman Newhoff, trustees, thank you for your time. I've had the opportunity to speak with a few of you and I appreciate the time you've given me. I am here tonight representing the nonprofit organization Parent Choice and Voice. We are about organizing parents, providing unification as one to advocate for the right to choose the educational opportunities they deem appropriate. All our members are parents or guardians of school children who reside in West Ada. This includes many teachers. These are unprecedented times which require unique solutions to ensure our rights to equal access to basic minimum education through a uniform and thorough system of public, free, and common schools. This is the law. Right now, my special needs daughter and I, on an IEP is not even getting 50% of her required educational requirements. On her off day, she gets one hour online. A sophomore at Mountain View was in honor science and had a 4.0. She is failing biology this year. An eighth grader at Lake Hazel Middle School was told by his teacher that he did not need to log in on the off days of in-person learning because the teacher will be teaching the other team on those days. I get emails daily from parents with similar stories. This is what drives me. We are not placing blame, but pointing out the deficiencies. We believe the district is one of the top districts in the state. We have amazing teachers, staff and families who support you. Parents' Choice and Voice wants to be a part of the solution. If we keep a majority of our kids remote or hybrid, what is going to change to ensure these children are getting the education required? To date, this has not been achieved. Offer a clear 
and concise choice for all families and teachers. Allow families to choose online or in person. Offer this to teachers. We would appreciate you making these important decisions based on factual data. We need you to explain your actions using scientific data. Parents feel like there's a lot of guesswork going on and we realize this is new and there will be that. Are you considering a holistic approach to your reaction to the situation we are in? Are you considering psychological, emotional, educational, and many negative impacts your decisions will have on these children? Did you consider consulting with a child psychologist and a pediatrician? This would validate the findings. Many more questions. We appreciate your time and your efforts, and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Halliday. Uh, Maya, you were for the next item, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, the next name I have is Sheila Benson. We all spoke on this microphone and we're all, <laughs> all the germs. But anyway, um, I'm Sheila Benson. I'm a new parent to the West Ada School District coming from California. And uh, I appreciate all of the uh, input tonight. Um, but what I'm not hearing is anything about the educational needs of our children. It's all been about COVID. COVID, 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 and how we're going to protect the parents and how to protect the teachers and all of that. I adore teachers. I am a realtor. I have given up my commission so that realtor or er, uh, teachers could buy houses. You know, I have a great passion for the educators of my kids, but my kids need education and they're not getting it. You know, my son is an 11th grader at Eagle, and my daughter is a 9th grader. They're two years behind what we left in California, and we came here because we wanted to be in person. We moved our whole family to be in person. I came to this building twice on a fact-finding trip to find out where my kids could go in person because they didn't do well remote. And now this, I'm really, really disappointed. And I'd like to offer a solution. You may not agree with it, but why don't we put the teachers who are concerned into the virtual schoolhouse and put the parents and the kids who are concerned in virtual schoolhouse and let everybody else go. Make them sign waivers. That's what we have to do in real estate. We have to sign a waiver, COVID waiver, so that we can all just get along and do what we need to do. I would gladly sign that so that my kids could attend in person. Right now, my kids don't do anything on their off days. They're sleeping till 10, 11 o'clock in the morning and they don't have to check in or sign in or do anything. It's a joke, and I really, really think that we need to take a different approach to this. This 157-page uh, entry, I mean, I came here in February and April, and I would have assumed that you guys would have had a plan. You told me <laughs> you were going to be in person, and, you know, that just didn't happen. And here we are in October talking about a 157-page plan to bring our kids back to school. I just don't understand it. So anyway, I appreciate your time. You can take it for what it's worth. But anyway, I had my say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Benson. The next name I have is Brad Blankenship. Well, it seems I misspelled my name. My name is Grant Blankenship. I'm the founder of SOS, an organization mission to raise the quality of uh, the, public, the Idaho public education system. We cannot move forward without coming to grips with the current plan. I know we can overcome the challenge if we face it and we do it together. 
My goal tonight is to appeal to you through sympathy and empathy. I am empathetic with the parents and patrons of West Ada School District that feel betrayed, misled, or lied to by the board not upholding their commitment to move remote learning at a time of community sp substantial community spread. I also sympathize with those that want normalcy in an unprecedented time. I've accepted that going fully remote is not the intention of the board of the district. Time and experience have shown me that during unprecedented times, we must adapt to our surroundings and we cannot appease everyone. But we should still stand united. We should be sympathetic, empathetic, and compassionate, and above all other, we should promote humanity. The safety of the West Data staff, teachers, students, all of their family in the community should be at the forefront of our decisions. Dr. Payton Associates believe a complete rewrite of the plan is in order and can be likely produce a more concise and clear plan for the district and staff. I would like to see a transparent effort with a sense of urgency to address the overwhelming problems we face. I wish to compel the board and the district to keep the current model in place until Dr. Pate has completed the plans he is creating and we can ensure safety for everyone. Now, you cannot guarantee social distancing in classrooms. The average square foot of elementary class is eight to 900 feet. That doesn't take into account cubbies, closets, sinks, and areas. The most you can fit in a room is 15 students. Bringing back K through three, with 26 students does not follow that guideline. The one thing that I have, hear, that I have heard echo in here is regain trust. The trust of everyone that, stand, that sits in front of me, you have lost the trust. Rebuilding that trust, I feel it would be necessary to rebuild that trust through an independent third party conducting unannounced audits with little to no involvement. It is in the best interest of all of us involved to do that. Restore that trust, enhance communications, transparency. I compel each and every one of you to be leaders and stand and vocally express to the community that we need to stand united and I will end by acknowledging our mutual commitment to creating viable solutions to the difficulties we will face returning students safely to the classroom while showing empathy for our educators and providing them with some solace. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, sir. The next name I have is Zachary Borman. Um, my name is Zachary Borman. I teach at Rocky Mountain High School. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, trustees, and Dr. Reynolds. My first concern with this plan that is being proposed tonight is the health of the community. If you think the valley is hurting now, if you change nothing of substance and wait two months, uh, well, just wait two months. Um, if insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results, it is by definition insane to believe that moving forward with the hybrid model will, while hospitals are on the brink, there is a consistent percentage of our community who categorically refuse to wear masks and teachers are voicing their inability to fully comply with the guidelines that thinking anything is going to change for the better. Our living room is on fire and rather than running for a bucket of water, we're sitting here debating about opening the curtains. There will be large emotional and economic impacts for individuals and families and our community at large if we do nothing. There will most assuredly be lives lost that would not have been lost otherwise. Sitting here and pretending that we don't see this coming and that schools and sports are not contributing to it is disingenuous and irresponsible. My second concern has to do with education. Moving forward, we are subjecting ourselves to random large-scale inconsistency based off of surging numbers in schools and areas. Switching between in-person and remote is hard on everyone involved and impedes education every time, every time something changes. Teachers and students need to react, uh, need time to react to these car kinds of large scale changes and the plans, and the plan opens us up to this kind of large scale change on a weekly basis. Um, additionally, if you ask, and it's already been mentioned a couple times tonight, but if you ask any teacher at the high school level at least, kids don't do anything on remote days and all this plan adds is additional remote days. There's no accountability for teachers or administration to like ensure that students, you can mark them absent, but I don't think absences mean anything this year. And uh, ultimately the kids, there's no due dates for anything either. So kids know and they're exploiting the loopholes 
And effectively, what you're giving us is for second quarter, you're giving us about 18 academic days with kids in front of us. And I dare you to try to teach AP chemistry or biology or US history in 18 days. It's not going to happen. My final concern is with teachers. 70% of us told us, told you clearly in the survey that you sent out that we did not support continuing re hybrid and red. Even more of us, if you count the teachers that already left, the, left for the Digital Academy at the start of the year because they were concerned this would happen. While many aren't speaking up or are afraid to take action because they don't want to lose their job or be without health care in the middle of a pandemic, you can bet when this all comes down and the dust clouds clear, uh, when we are able to count our lost and wounded and all the emotional pain that of this year catches up to us, uh, we will remember that you ignored our warnings and the trust issues that Dr. Pate talked about earlier are going to be a major problem of morale and whether or not there's going to be a severe teacher shortage next year remains to be, me be seen. So please do the right thing. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next, the next name I have is Hope I'm reading this right. Kelly Deed Hoyer. So I apparently misspelled my own name. Um, I am Kelly Reed Hoyer. I'm from Rocky Mountain High School. Um, Mr. Chairman, trustees, uh, Dr. Rennells. Um, we we've heard a lot about. Uh, from parents about how they're concerned that their children are failing. Um, I did some quick numbers. I, I looked at my own attendance over the last month. I have 98 students, a total of 98 students this semester, in, or this quarter, sorry. Um, it all boils down to 18 weeks worth of instruction crammed into nine. Um, I have 98 students one month there were 171 absences from 98 students only 57 of those absences are accounted for we have some students on iso we have some students out ill we have some extracurriculars but only 57 of those 171 absences are accounted for. It is still, it has never stopped being a parent's job to get their kids to school. And on the off days, if the kids aren't logging in, that's the parents not getting the kids to school. I can't teach kids who aren't there. Whether it's virtual or in person. I can do my best. I can follow up with them and make, try to make sure they're understanding next time I see them. But when they're not there, I can't teach them. It's impossible. You know, um, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, though, is I, I read this really interesting statistic. Uh, at the start of COVID, uh, they started tracing um, the mental health of, of um, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't remember the word in either one of my languages right now. Um, essential, sorry, essential employees. They started tracking the mental health. Teachers have reported a 46% increase in mental health issues that now matches the ER nurses who are dealing with this pandemic as well. And what we have not seen is the emotional impact that all of this is having on our students. They need stability. They need stability. We need stability. They need it even more. And you are not giving it to them. You must do something. You must do better. We have begged you. We are pleading with you. Do better for these kids. Do better for your employees and do better for our parents. Because Zach's right. When the dust settles, we may just all go find somebody else who will do better for us, parents and teachers alike.
Thank you. And again, I, I'm doing my best to read the names, and so I apologize for the the D. The R looked like a D, and I, you know, um, and and I would ask people to please respect the speakers and not make comments and and speak while they're speaking. Um, the the next name I have is Asundra Becker. It's a, it's a Santa Becker. Uh, I live at 5996 North Botticelli here in Meridian. I am one of your great West Ada teachers and I'm a proud West Ada parent. So I wanted to come talk to you because I've emailed you, but here I am. Somehow this virus has become a political platform and I don't understand and I don't envy you. I wouldn't want to be you. I wouldn't want to make your decisions. This is hard. It is hard for all of us. But I heard a lot about trust. The first way to repair the trust is to listen. We have to seek first to understand and then to be understood. That's one of the seven habits I teach my kindergartners every single day. It's okay. I <laughs> am um, happy we're finally seeking the advice of a medical professional. Thank you for volunteering your time. I'm thinking we are rushing again to push for all these kids to be back at school. We don't have a good plan. We have problems. Your teachers are telling you there's problems. We have to put the horse before the cart, not the cart before the horse. We can't keep changing the plan and hoping it's all going to work out in the wash. Um, I was hopeful today until I got an email telling me that all of my kindergartners are, might come back. I love them. I do. I love their hugs. I love, and I still give them <laughs> with my mask on and their mask on. It's less than 15 minutes, man. <laughs> um, last uh, Wednesday when I returned to work, I was happy. <laughs> on Thursday, my principal, who's amazing, Lori Wright, she's awesome. She asked me, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? And I said, you know, yesterday felt so good. I walked out and I had my held, head held high as I gave those p kids back to their parents. And I felt like I was doing the right thing. For the first time since September 8th, those kids were six feet apart. And I could do it all day long. And they didn't have to sit in a chair all day. They could go from their chair to their assigned spot at the carpet. And they were six feet apart because half of them were there. But when they're all there, when I have 19 five-year-olds, you can't keep them six feet apart. You can't do it when they're at recess. You can't do it when they're in the classroom. You can't do it when they're lined up. I mean, I've tried so hard with half of them. Okay, Johnny, when Kate in front of you stops, you stop too. They can't do it. So bringing them all in and leading people to believe we're physically distancing them, it's not possible. Physical distancing is the number one most important thing. Let's figure that out before we bring them all back. I want them here too. I'm here to tell you that 95% of my students have participated in their remote learning over the last few days that I've been doing it, and I have 0% angry parents. It can be done. We can do it together. We need to find the teachers that are doing it and doing it well, and we need to leverage those strengths and share those things out with others. As a parent, I have an eighth grader at Star Middle School. She's in honors and GT courses for the very first time ever. She transferred there from IFA. Um, she's never taken advanced classes in middle school. She's getting straight A's. She has two full-time working parents. She's doing it on her own. Nobody has to force her to do it. It can be done. Is it great? Is it perfect? No. Does she have to hunt around to find her assignments? Yes, but she can do it. We can all do this together. But putting all of these kids back in school, it's going to risk teacher safety. It's going to risk kids' safety, and we can't keep the physical distancing. So let's figure it out together and then get the kids back. Let's not put the cart before the horse anymore. Thank you so much, and I love my kids, and I'll be there with a smile on my face either way. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Becker. The next name I have is Angela Vol. Hi, my name is Angela Vol. I am coming to you in three different capacities tonight. As the mother of a sixth grader, as a substitute teacher that you were relying on to fill the shoes of these teachers when you need a body in that classroom to be there when they are out for being sick or a personal day, whatever that is. And also as 
an advocate for many, many parents within our district, many teachers who have contacted me, and I want to express our concerns. Back in August, August 7th, I believe it was Dr. Rannells who sent out an, a district-wide newsletter that said, if we went to 20% in COVID cases throughout our community, and our community is this room, our schools, everywhere in this county, and Canyon County, everywhere, not just our classrooms, not just our schools, that we would go completely remote within 48 hours. Parents planned on that. We relied on that. And those are how we made our decisions. Do we keep our child in West Ada? Do we put them in virtual schoolhouse? Do we put them in a private school? Do we pull them completely from the district? That is how we based our decisions. As a substitute teacher, I have been working for the district for three years in this capacity. This is my fourth. I have never, ever been afraid to walk into a school as much as I am now. I have not been given any information on how I need to conduct my classes. I know because I'm a parent and I'm that responsible parent and I want to know, so I do the research. I know I have to have my kids with their mask on. I know they have to be distanced. I understand that. I know that. But there has been nothing sent to your substitute teachers. I have seen more information go out to my sixth grader than I have to your substitute teachers that you're relying on daily. And that is not okay. That email, that survey that went to my sixth grader, nothing that should never have gone out to her. I am furious over it. Parents are furious over it. I am not the only one. Our teachers, are need, our teachers need to be able to feel like they're safe in their classroom. They are not. I cannot tell you how many I have talked to that have called me crying or anything else. Please do the right thing. Please find some way for us to put our kids safely in school, and for our teachers to be able to teach safely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fall. The next name I have is Kristen Heath. Good evening, Chairman, Trustees, and Superintendent Rannells. My name is Dr. Kristen Heath. I am the proud parent of three children in Prospect Elementary. One day, my daughter quit walking. I was terrified. I didn't understand why she, all of a sudden, one day, she wasn't able to walk anymore. I went to the doctor, and he was like, I don't know either. And she must just be stubborn. And so, as a parent, did I just stop there? No, as a parent, I kept on doing my research and I kept on looking and looking for answers to find out why my daughter wasn't walking anymore. And I came up with the diagnosis, not because I'm smarter than anybody else, but because I was the most invested in my child. And that is why I believe that the choice should lie on parents. We understand the mental health issues of our children. We understand whether or not people are immunocompromised. We understand all of these things. So the choice should be on our shoulders. So today I want to give you two points. Um, first, um, why I'm qualified to make the decision. And second, why um, if we don't allow this choice for parents and teachers, that they will continue to be discontent in the school district. First, I have a doctor in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis in educational technology. I'm a teacher and a director for an online international school. I know a couple things about remote learning. My husband is a nurse. He takes care of COVID patients long term. He gets to see them before, during, and after the virus. We are not afraid of the risks. We, we've seen how COVID reacts. And so we want to send our parents to our children to school. But we're not all in the same boat. Um, and all of those qualifications um, are, are, are not as important as the fact that I'm their parent. It's my God-given right to decide whether or not what is best for them. And I need to have that choice. Um, if we don't allow for choice, parents, teachers, and students will continue to be discontent. 
You've seen all these speeches. Nobody's happy with the plan. Um, the angry letters will continue. The lawsuits will continue. Everything will continue. Teachers may quit. They may strike. Um, I surveyed a group of 4,000 parents, and 61% said they would unenroll, and 25% were unsure if we went to complete remote learning. There are some serious consequences to not allowing these choices. So we came up with a plan. I'm part of Parents' Choice and Voice. You've heard of us uh, with a couple other speakers. Um, it's a simple plan. It's not a 137-page plan. I don't know how many, but it's a simple plan. Just simply allow us the choice. Allow parents to choose whether we feel safe with full-time instruction in a building or allow us to choose the remote. Take away hybrid. Um, we've seen that in hybrid, it can actually have less safety because of people are in daycares or interacting other ways. So just remove that choice. Give us the choice. Um, and that would be a simple plan. So I want to end with, I agree, with one thing that Dr. Pate did say. He should not be making these decisions. You should not be making these decisions. Let the parents make the decision what is best for our personal situations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Heath. Uh, next name I have is James Crick. My name is James Crick. I 1720 East Adelaide Drive. Um, just want to speak kind of candidly a little bit. We had some conversations earlier today, or were listening to conversations earlier today, and a couple items that came up. One of them was accountability was one thing that came through, um, and all the planning that we've seen and all the plans that have been rolled out. Um, when people don't comply has not been spelled out. Um, we unfortunately live in a society where we are all grouped together as one community. We are only as strong as our weakest individual. If we have mask mandates in our, in our cities and in our state, and we have signs on the doors that say you must wear a mask when you go into a grocery store, and we have people who don't wish to comply, um, that causes a problem all around. So it shows the weakness in our own society before we can even address the schooling issues. Um, we originally rolled out a, a plan when we first started this year. Was We had three different colors, green, yellow, and red. Yellow was always a hybrid model. Red was remote. Um, that's what we built our work schedules on. Most of, these, most of the students and most of the parents of those students had to build on that plan. Now that plan has changed. Um, saying that we're going to be in red, but we're going to pretend that we're in yellow. Um, um, so that information, um, the hybrid model, yes, if our COVID cases go down and drop, are going to be, that's when we should go back to that hybrid model. We have teachers and students who are putting their lives on the line to educate themselves. And we have teachers who are, in essence, soldiers in a war against COVID that have to go in there every day and fight that fight. Um, I work for a large shipping company and we do the same thing. We have to deliver or people won't get those goods. So we have to face that same battle as well. So um, I would urge that we stick with the original plan that if the state is in red, we go remote. Now, is remote the best thing for everybody? It was brought up that, you know, the education level that the, that the students will receive may be different or be experienced differently depending upon how the student um, wants to learn. Fortunate, unfortunately, in some cases, um, we do have uh, parents who aren't fully engaged in their child's education. Fortunately for me, my wife is very adamant about education and is helping our teenager get through high school. She's well on her way, but um, if we have the remote capabilities and we have the ability to do it, I think we should just stick with the single plan, let everybody adjust to it first before we change it and try to make it any better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crick. And then the last name I have is Megan Case. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Dr. Reynolds, members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. 
My name is Megan Case, and I have three children in West Ada schools, two of them in general education elementary classrooms and one in a special needs preschool program offered by the school district. I am here tonight in support of the teachers and building staff and administration in the West Ada School District. Like many parents here and at home, I have several concerns with what is happening in our district. But my biggest concern is the perceived lack of trust shown in our teachers and staff at our school buildings. Last spring, after only a few weeks of teaching our children at home, parents were professing their appreciation and gratitude for our hardworking teachers and staff. We said they needed raises. They promised to never complain again when asked to bring a box of Kleenex. We said we needed them in our buildings to educate our kids. You ask us to trust them. So I do. And I'm reminded of that trust annually when I get an email from my principal saying that our teachers will be leading our kids through an active shooter safety drill. I trust them that should that drill ever become a real life scenario that every teacher and staff member in a West Ada school building will use every resource and act ounce of knowledge they have to keep my child alive when a bad guy shows up in their hallway. But now the bad guy in the form of this virus and all the contention that it brings is in their classroom. But what's changed that we no longer trust their knowledge or expertise in running a safe and effective school. I am grateful to Dr. Payton and his team for coming up with the resolution to bring our kids back into school, but I feel it misses the mark. It supports parents who want their kids in school every day. Parents who say they want a choice in their children's education. They don't want a choice, they want their way. I believe that everyone has the best interest of getting our kids back in a classroom, but you're hearing consistently that being in a classroom is not the right place for our kids to be. It was touched on that nurses are available to help monitor symptoms within our kids, but of the two elementary schools that my children attend, only one of them has a half-time nurse. The other has, um, a noon duty with no health experience who is promoted to oversee this position. I've never doubted that teachers will rise to the occasion necessary to teach my kids in a safe and structured way. I've never doubted them. It's the hurdles and walls and unattainable requirements that the administration continues to put before them that has lost my confidence. Pass the resolution that shows support for and trust in our teachers because at the end of the day, they're the experts I trust to keep my children's best interests at heart. Thank you, Ms. Case. And uh, that concludes the public testimony and brings us to discussion item number three, update of instructional quality and remote learning from uh, Dr. Barrett. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Matt, can I ask you a question? Just for yeah. time, time's sake, um, yeah. Matt, Matt, or is it okay to ask one? Sorry. Please. For time's sake, um, I guess I have a question around, do, if we don't have an action on this one tonight, would we be better to, I'm just kind of trying to figure out how long we're gonna go. So that's my question. It's up for you. I just, I'm starting to look at the time and get concerned. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, um, Trustee Johnson. So next so we have a meeting next tuesday i i <laughs> does i mean yeah does oh, that great. is that cool because we actually the it's agenda cool. is not nearly yeah no, well at least what i've seen is, of it isn't quite fantastic. as no problem okay great thank you so thank you trustee johnson so we're going to um table discussion item three until i guess the next meeting what you, you want a motion so does that? You want me to add? Sure. Mr. Chair, I move that we table um, item number three on the discussion until uh, next week's agenda. All right. Thank you, Trustee Johnson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Trustee Azuna. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll entertain a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 
All right, and so um, item number three is tabled till the next meeting. That brings us to the action portion of the agenda. And the first item um, is listed as remote learning options. It pertains to discussion item number two, and I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair. Trustee Johnson. Before we, I make a motion, would it be possible to just kind of understand where each everyone sit? Is there a little chance for discussion just amongst the trustees, or would you prefer just a motion first? <clears throat> well, I think actually protocol requires a motion here, so. Okay. Okay. I got to think then. I appreciate that, Maya, but at this, I mean, I, I know I'm out of order, but um, when I was going to have asked about why don't we do something sooner, um, next week we have teacher conferences and the kids are out on Thursday, Friday, and the voting so there's no school on Tuesday, um, and the kindergarten is running on Wednesday, so that might be a good Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion on action item number one. Trustee Azuna. I'm gonna make this motion for what I think is in the best interests of kids and what I believe in our plan with where we're going um, with what I believe that our teachers can do and listening to their input. I'm going to move that we um, accept the recommendation made by the administration with the change that we make fourth grade and fifth grade mimic K through three and that we give authority to Dr. Rannells to move individual classrooms or schools into remote based on um, what's happening with spread in our schools to give her the authority to move quickly on anything uh, related to outbreaks. Thank you, Trustee Azuna. Is the clerk clear on the motion? Trustee Azuna, could you just repeat the last part for, was it middle schools to move into? No, I, I would. Um, I just want to make sure I got it again. Right. Okay. Just so my motion is for K through five to follow the recommendation by administration, but that would um, look like that for K through five. So it would be team one, Tuesday, Thursday, team two, Wednesday, Friday, with an early release. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's all students. Sorry. It's all students. K through five, all day, every day with an early release Monday secondary as proposed by administration. I guess I won't go through all the details. I don't want to mess that up in what I'm saying here. And then the second piece of that is the authority to Dr. Rannells to close the schools or individual classrooms as needed based on outbreaks that are happening. Thank you, Trustee Azuna. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Trustee Johnson, for the second. Is there any discussion? Trustee Johnson. Mr. Chair, I have a question or um, and ask if tr the motion maker would accept a friendly amendment in one piece, and it's an add-on, that we ask administration to look towards second semester and giving parents and teachers a choice around remote um, learning options or in-person learning options. So to figure out what the demand is from both the parent and the teacher side as a, just an add-on amendment to that motion. Is that acceptable uh, amendment, Mr. Chair? Because I wanted, I wanted. To, I guess I should ask you that first for clarification. I think it is. Let's let's see if the uh, clerk can 
pared that back. <laughs> I'm sorry to put you on the on the spot here, Mrs. Newbold, but I have something what? written. Maybe I could. Do you have something written, Trustee Johnson? Yeah. Due to past experiences, I would prefer that things are being written down because somehow it yep. is said differently. So, if I could have that, I would prefer that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yeah. Um, I would request that this motion be considered separately, not as an amendment. That that with uh, that that we would uh, vote on the main motion or on the amended motion, depending on the call of the chairman. Okay. Uh, thank you, Trustee Smiley. I guess the uh, the the approach here. Did you? Do you have it written down now? Um, I can. I, I guess the approach here is we have to vote on the friendly amendment, right? So. Well, yes, she has to accept it. For if she accept, if yeah. Trustee Azuna accepts it, so. Chairman Newhoff, point of point of order. Yeah. Uh, my apologies. Um, the, the proper way to do a, a friendly amendment. Is actually it's, it's the whole board. The whole board would own it, and they'd have to vote on it. It's something we've actually been doing wrong for quite some time. So unless we want to choose to you know, continue choosing this way, it's not quite Robert's rules. Uh, would it be okay for the uh, for the motion to be basically made separately and then consumed into the main motion, which is how the proper way to do it? It's almost like the idea is a ladder. With the main so wait, so we vote part. on the main motion or the. The, the amendment the first, amendment and, then, yeah, we, yeah. and then that gets consumed yeah. into the main motion, yes. Thank the you. The easiest way is just to, for Dr. Reynolds to say we could look into this for you and we could, <laughs> we could skip it. <laughs> but <laughs> I have it written. I don't know which way to go. <laughs> so you tell me where to go. So if you're, if I understand the suggestion of, of my colleague, Trustee Kloffenstein, you're making a motion which, once you get it written down here, I'd ask you to repeat, and then we'd need a, a second, and then a vote on that, and then a vote on Trustee Azuna's initial motion. Okay. I have it written, and okay. I will Please. Um, read it, and then I will give Sherry this piece of paper, um, or Clerk Newbold. So, I move for a friendly amendment to ask administration to work on options to give for parents and teachers for choice for the second semester, so this would be January, for in-person or remote to distribute our staff, or distribute our system. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion about this? I, I actually, I have a quite, I just want to make sure that what you just read is that the administration understands it. <laughs> Looking at you, Dr. Randles. So, you're asking if I would move Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing none, then I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? All right, and it passes 3-0. With two abstentions. And that brings us to the initial motion, which we still need a second on. Oh, oh no, actually, Trustee Johnson second. I'm sorry. It's getting late. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, is there any discussion on the original motion? Uh, Trustee uh, Kloffenstein. Chairman Newhoff, thank you. I, I just had one uh, friendly amendment, if you wouldn't mind. Um, an additional, a bigger pardon. Um, that my, my request would be that. Um, the time available to t for teachers on our, our on the Monday would just be held solely for prep time, PLC time, or for teacher support time with students. 
So we just reserve that for this intended purposes. Is that Chairman, uh, may I ask a question? So is that for the early release time for the elementary? No, or is that for the remote as well? Beg your pardon. It's for that uh, that day. So, if we're going to reserve time for teachers to support students, um, that we just make sure there's no building-wide meetings or um, or other outside activities that consumes that time. So we just make sure we're specially holding that time. So, uh, Chairman, Trustees, the worry I have is that in trying to provide additional prep time for the teachers that day, we still have to provide a certain amount of instruction that day remotely so that it, it counts. Um, otherwise, we'd be adding days. And I beg your pardon, so part, of my, part of my motion was also to uh, support their st student study or to class time. Um, okay. So just whatever open time. My apologies, I'm being vague. Okay. Okay. Do you need that written down? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And while you're writing while that down. He, yeah, it can get a second so we can, or is there a second? I was going to ask if we could get any feedback from um, Dr. Well, we, we need a second before we. Move on okay, second. So. All right. So, discussion. would it be possible to get feedback from Mr. Heller or Dr. Rannells on any concerns on making sure that that prep time period is reserved strictly for the teacher's needs? Mr. Chairman, trustees, I would say, if I understand correctly, um, what I believe Trustee Klopfenstein is asking is that the time of the day, the portion of the day that is designated for teacher support time, teacher prep time, that we don't eat that time up with unnecessary building meetings, that it truly is teacher preparation time and teacher collaboration time. Is that correct? That's correct. So I would say I have no concerns whatsoever that that's, in fact, our buildings in preparation for this have already started structuring exactly how that portion of their day will be will be used to make sure that it's for teacher PLC time um, with their collaboration teams and for that teacher preparation time so I have no concerns with that is there any other discussion uh, trustee smiley mr. chairman I I'm gonna vote against this motion not because I don't support the concept I absolutely support the concept but I think that what we heard from uh, Assistant Superintendent Heller is, is, is right on. That's, that's the whole point. And I think we're getting a little into the weeds when we start uh, adding this stuff here. Because I, I think that the spirit of the motion, it's, this is already there. And I, I, I consider it a bit redundant. <laughs> I perhaps agree, but... Um, <laughs> No offense, Trustee Klopfenstein, but is there any other discussion? All right. Seeing none, then, I'm, or do you have the motion to the clerk? So if I may rephrase, um, so any prep time provided to teachers remains specifically for teacher PLC or for teacher collaboration. Would that be? Because um, it's only for prep time provided. So I'm limiting it to prep time provided. Would that be reasonable? Yes, that's correct. I do. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'll call for a, a vote then. All those in favor of this second friendly amendment, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. And the chair abstains. Um, for reasons I think I just stated, so it passes or it fails. One a one I three nays and 
an abstention. And then this brings us to the original motion. And is there, is there any other discussion about the original motion? All right, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope, passed unanimously. That brings us to action item number two, the trustee resignation in zone three and board declaration of a vacancy in zone three. And I would, <coughs> do you want to talk before? Or I um, Mr. Chairman, I, I will defer. Uh, I could just simply take the floor here on a point of personal privilege and just simply give my, explain what, what, I'm, what I'm doing here. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and fellow trustees, uh, and we saw this tonight, um, when adults fight, children lose. And I'm very proud of this district. Uh, we, we lead the state in so many categories. We are the largest. Our test scores are year after year after year at the top, our individual achievement, uh, our attention to the emotional and, 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 and uh, other needs of our students, I think is unparalleled. We have an amazing team of administrators, counselors, teachers, coaches. Uh, we are, this is an amazing district. And you know, most of us came onto this board during a sense time of crisis and we restored and we were able to restore a real sense of normalcy and COVID came along and we lost that sense but think of some of the things that the board does we set policy we go over budgets we we look at contracts we look at projects the really important stuff that a board does is kind of the boring stuff and you know as we look at all the things that we're trying to do for our students, uh, we, we have to let the people that we hire do their jobs. And they do it admirably well. I, 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 I can't single anyone out for criticism. Um, we do it efficiently. We have the lowest assessed rate in the <coughs> valley. We, for a, lo a district of our size, we are one of the most thrifty districts in the nation and we still achieve all the things that we do uh, look at the you know in the last uh, in the last few years we've opened up five buildings and remod and done a complete remodeling of our high school we're going to be opening up Oahe high school we were able to get the deal with the Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine done and get that done to the benefit of everybody in the community. We, when we've been able to accomplish a lot of great things. Uh, we were a pioneer district in choice. We have academies. We have Renaissance High School. We have the Idaho Fine Arts Academy. We have uh, STEM elementary schools, fine arts elementary schools, traditional elementary schools. We pioneered the virtual schoolhouse. We have done a lot of things. And I do know that we fellow board members have dedicated countless hours to pouring over all our agendas and everything like that. Um, and we do it, we volunteer our time. And I want you to know that everything that my, my colleagues do, it is so appreciated. Um, my children and now my grandchildren have graduated from West State Schools. I am proud of this district and I always will be. But no one was prepared for a pandemic. And it has turned into division, it's turned, and I totally get why the parents are concerned. I totally get why the teachers are concerned. And they have every right to be, they should be. But whenever I had a parent conference, and I've been in hundreds of them, the first thing I always say is, can we agree on one thing? Before we get into any other discussions, let's agree on one thing. We are here for the benefit of this child. As adults, we will have different opinions. We may even have passionately held different opinions. But can we agree that we are here for the benefit of those children? 
we've been criticized in so many ways. Um, what we heard tonight was a lot of anger, a lot of passion. I get it. Uh, I listen to radio commentators and other people that have gotten onto social media. Um, I've been called a lot of wonderful little names. I've had, uh, I, I lost count at about 540 emails and I stopped counting. I haven't been able, even been able to open some of them. There are just so many of them. Um, and some people, you know, we have, there's that great line from Otis Redding, sitting on the dock of the bay, in which he says, can't do what 10 people tell me. <laughs> and we've tried to compromise, we've tried to come up with the hybrid plan, and it turns out all the people that want to go remote hate the hybrid plan, and all the people that want the kids in class hate the hybrid plan. And this is the sort of thing we're getting. Um, and, you know, we even have governmental leaders have sent us letters advising us what we should be doing. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, we have lots of self-appointed experts that know so much more than we do, and, and we're just citizens. We, we, we all have children that have gone through the district. We all care about our schools. We're all proud of our schools, and we're doing the best we can. Um, every choice it seems now as a trustee that I have is inadequate. I took this position and hoped that my 45 years of experience doing this would be of service. Uh, I've been in government, I've been a teacher, I've been an administrator, I've been a leader in other, other community action items. And I've been a resident of this district for since my kids were little. And uh, every day my e e email box inbox is full yet again. And they're all telling us to do different things. And you know, it's, it's gotten to the point that uh, I've tried to answer every email and I, I can't keep up. I, I'm at the age where I failed in trying to retire. I retired from teaching. I retired from the university. I've tried to retire from everything three different times and I've failed. But I, I think it's finally time. It's time for me to go on. I got, I spent the week last week with two amazing grad children. And I know that the stress in our household, my wife said, I don't even recognize you. And it's time to get back to normal for me. I have every confidence in the leaders we've picked in this district, and I have every confidence in you, uh, my colleagues, that you'll, you'll find somebody that'll have that same spirit. Um, I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish. I'm proud of this district, but um, I, I think it's just time for me to move on because I can't do what 10 people tell me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Trustee Smiley. Is there a motion? Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. no. No, you're. Yeah. I, I was going to excuse myself from the discussion, if that's okay. You're not. You, you are going to come back for one last second on an adjournment, yes. right? Okay. <laughs> Is there a motion, I Trustee? Mr. Chair, I don't know how to make the motion. Somebody else has to. I haven't done this before. Um, we had some suggestions. <laughs> I'm just going to read it. Uh, trustee, uh, I move that we accept the trustee resignation in Zone 3 and board declaration of a vacancy in Zone 3 as presented. Is there a second? second. Is there any discussion? Um, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, Trustee Smile is an honorable man, and uh, we're going to we're going to miss him a lot, and it'll also be a big big hole in our uh, in our board. So, be big shoes for somebody to fill. You all lost or losing a great man tonight. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. And Trusty Smiley recuses himself and passes unanimously. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Trusty Johnson. Is there a second? Thank you, Trustee Johnson, for the motion. Trustee Klaffenstein for the second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And we are adjourned. Good night. <laughs>